PMSTheBarLive.com. PMS, the Pugs Moran Show for a, uh, well, what appears to be a Thursday afternoon. Okay, hold on. Quick temperature check. We are, of course, coming to you live from the Sunbury Summer Beach House located in beautiful, sunny North Dallas, Texas. Jimmy, what do you think the temperature is? Uh, 102. Yeah, my car said it was 103. That's a good guess, 102. It's still yeah. early. Uh-huh. Still early in the day. Which is crazy. Yeah. So yeah. it's probably going to go a little higher than that. Yeah. What I'm showing, though, once again, in my Sunbrew Summer Beach House. Summer Beach House? What am, I, what am I, Canadian? Yeah. The my uh, Sunbrew Summer Beach House thermometer, temperature gauge, the official temperature gauge. You know, when you watch the news and they have weather, mm-hmm. you know, they'll show like uh, readings at Love Field downtown dfw and the sunbrew house yeah <laughs> it is the official <laughs> reading at the sunbrew house 91 degrees fahrenheit <laughs> oh. once again that's wrong yeah it's totally wrong i just came in from outside you know what i do i crap on 91 degrees fahrenheit that's nothing yeah i'd be really excited about that please if i was if, if i had to run a marathon i would i would pray for it to be 91 degrees <laughs> it's not 91 degrees it's like 105 outside yeah we're not gonna get into this okay we're not going to get into this. CNN give you that as their uh, initial estimate? Of w- I'm sorry? CNN give you that as their initial estimate that it's 95 outside right now? They just kind of screwed up. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, this is funny. I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to get into that. M- yeah. Maybe maybe they're the douche of the day, <laughs> CNN. <laughs> maybe. Although, I got to tell you, a guy by the name of Arthur Daniel Stein. Arthur Daniel Stein. Mm. Daniel Stein. Fancy name for Dothan, Alabama. Yeah. And also a little Jewy for Dothan, Alabama. <laughs> R.L. Stein's oh. son. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? That's not his name. That's not the guy's name. Sorry, that was the person who was writing the story. Trying oh. to find this guy's <laughs> name. We're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about this guy that I saw today. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I I don't have the audio. I'm so sorry, folks. Look, as soon as I get a little bit more technically uh, comfortable with this whole thing. I'm going to be able to record stuff from home and bring it in. But uh, we're working in a breaking news world right now. And we've got a story that has broken within the last hour, uh, hour and a half probably now at this point, that is just massive. And, of course, mm. I'm talking about the Supreme Court's decision on uh, Obamacare, if that's what we want to call it. Personally, I call it Romney Care, But let's call it Obamacare. And I know, folks, we don't talk a lot about politics on this show. I try not to. I, why? Because I think politics is a massive waste of time. It's a mass, it's just, it's like, you know, it's like arguing with a USC fan about Notre Dame. You're not going to get anywhere. You're just not. It's like, you know, right? Yeah, I, I stopped even trying. Because there was a little time there where uh, I would, like, try to have conversations, actual conversations, not arguments, none of this stuff. But that's not possible. Everyone already has their opinions made, and who am I to try to persuade them? Do you know why I think it's not possible why is that? to have a conversation with one of these people? Hmm. Because for the most part, the vast majority of us aren't talk show hosts and talk show producers and legal scholars and you know all these. We're, not, we're just regular people, okay? I do a lot more prep than the average person. You do a lot more prep than the average person. It's just, it's the nature of our job. We have to be able to freewheel on our feet on just about any subject that's in the news on that day. Mm. We have to have some, what Kelly used to call, cocktail party knowledge of absolutely everything. You know what cocktail party knowledge is? Uh, I would imagine knowledge you need at a cocktail party. Yeah, it's, okay. it's the ability to be at a cocktail party and stand in any circle of people and hang with the conversation for at least two or three minutes mm. and then excuse yourself. Mm. It's knowing just enough about any given subject to not look like an idiot and then bow out gracefully and move on to the next circle. Yeah. That's cocktail party knowledge. I think everybody should have cocktail party knowledge. It's good to have because you don't want to get in one of those situations where you're midway through a conversation and realize, do I, am I giving away <laughs> that I don't know what, I, what they're talking about now? Or worse yet, being phony yeah. and making a huge mistake, right. like a glaring error. Yeah. <laughs> and then everybody there knows you're a huge fraud. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, Justin Bieber last night on, uh, I think it was Letterman. I think it was last night. Uh, Letterman made a comment about the Sistine Chapel. And he goes, no, I don't know anything about the 16th Chapel. But uh, and then he just, everyone just started cracking up because. Yes, I said the yeah. 16th Chapel. Yeah. yeah and Dave was, Dave was noticeably irritated that yeah. Justin Bieber didn't know. 
<laughs> How to pronounce the 16th chapel. <laughs> it is. It's the 16th. That's what it is. Yeah. I, I also saw a funny thing, uh, not to get too far off the path here. Saw mm-hmm. a funny thing with Justin Bieber yesterday. Uh, uh, Congressman Luis Gutierrez, who is a congressman from the Chicago area. Uh, I, I know him from years ago as a, as a crazy rabble rousing alderman in the city of Chicago. Mm-hmm. But, but I always liked this. I always liked him. I'm I'm not entirely certain about this. It was either Gutierrez or another guy named Juan Solis who went into uh, a courtroom with like a big bag of coke in his briefcase, <laughs> <laughs> and it was I don't remember how it happened. It was it was one of these guys. It was one of these guys, and it just it just smacked of. A plant. It just smacked that somebody was trying to embarrass this guy. Like, it was such a ridiculous mistake right. for someone in that position to do. And I, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I probably shouldn't have even mentioned it. But, but now I've got to look up Juan Solis and see if that was him. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Gutierrez on the floor of the, of the, the house was uh, complaining about the Arizona law. You know, show me your papers law, which you know, we talked about a little bit the other day. Uh, basically, the Arizona show me your papers law grants police uh, the ability to uh, detain someone and, and require them to show proof of residency, their papers, or whatever they are. Proof of, of being a, uh, what do they call that, a worker, you know, a, a green card, green whatever green card, it is. Yeah. yeah, But it gives them the right to do that just based on you know their own sort of judgment. Some people say it's profiling. Some people say it's police work. I tend to fall somewhere in the middle. You know? I, 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 don't, I don't think the whole profiling thing necessarily needs to be thrown out. I think that a lot of what profiling is is experience and police work, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean, you know, you sit in the w- uh, you sit behind a tree in the wealthiest neighborhood in town and just purposely pull over any brown-skinned person that drives through. That's different, you know? But so uh, Luis Gutierrez is making this big stink about what would happen in the state of Arizona if Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez, his girlfriend, were pulled over. And he put up two big pictures. He put up one big picture of Justin Bieber and another big picture of Selena Gomez. Now, you, you understand they're dating, Jimmy. Are you, are you aware of this? I was not aware. Selena, do you know who Selena Gomez is? I'm about to look her up. Look her up. Okay. She's adorable. I would imagine she is. I mean, Justin Bieber, it seems like he yeah. has every girl in the world She's tweeting adorable. about him. Do me a favor, though. Don't sexualize her, okay? She's still just a kid. She's just a really pretty little girl. And Justin Bieber's guy. So, don't, you know, don't be like, ah, she's hot. Although I do want to know. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, she attractive? Let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but she definitely does have that very young right. look. Yeah. We can draw the line there. Right. Yeah. We, we can all admit that, you know, she looks 16. Yeah, that's where, that's where the line is. Although she might be is. older than that. Really? Yeah. Even though you can't, I. No, there, doesn't there, look right. There are 16 year old girls mm. who do not look 16, they look no. 24. Yeah. And, and I, I think that it's. I don't know if it's appropriate to sexualize them, especially if you know they're 16, but you could, you could easily be excused for making the mistake with some girls right. thinking that they are older than they certainly are. Selena Gomez is not the case. No. Selena Gomez, she could be 24 years old. She still looks 17. Yeah, because when I was flipping over to it, you were saying, you know, don't sexualize her, and my intention was to immediately sexualize her. Of course her. it was. But then I saw her, and I was like, no, <laughs> I feel a bit creepy. You're, so. you're not looking up Kathy Bates, you know? Yeah. You're not, you know, you're, you're looking, you, you want to see what Selena Gomez, you want to see what Justin Bieber's getting. Mm-hmm. I can't blame you. It's a natural curiosity. Yeah, and good for him. So uh, Congressman Gutierrez has the big picture of Justin Bieber and the big picture of Selena Gomez, and he goes into this story about, all right, let's pretend that you are an Arizona State Highway Patrol officer. And you pull up, you pull over America's favorite teen couple, Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez. You know, obviously, Selena Gomez is Mexican, mm-hmm. and Justin Bieber is a perfectly white, good-looking, you know, all-American boy. Yeah. He said, now, you would probably think that Miss Gomez should be required to hand over some papers, right? You know, going with the mm-hmm. whole, she's Gomez, she's Mexican, and all that. And he goes, oh, but you would be wrong. <laughs> you see, Miss Gomez of Texas is not the is not the uh, the illegal in this situation. It's Justin Bieber of Canada. <laughs> you know, it was just this whole big thing about, and it was interesting, and it yeah. was true. But again, you know, now we're splitting hairs. You know, that's, that's a situation. That's a rare situation. You found one situation that you can tell the right. story of, yeah. And besides, let's cut through all the crap. This isn't about Canadians coming through the woods into Minnesota, okay? This isn't what this whole thing is about. We know what it's about. It's about Mexicans. Have you ever seen the Canadian border? Yeah, I've been on the Canadian border. No issue there. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, you can end up. You can go hunting. Yeah. You can go hunting and end up in Canada and not yeah. even know you're there. Oh, hey. It's like it's like hiking in South Korea. <laughs> Take one wrong turn, you don't know where you are. Suddenly, you know, you're in a dungeon somewhere yeah. in Boon Yang. <laughs> Is that even a city? Is that even a city? I don't even know. Town Yang. Is, 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 yeah, that's capital yeah. North Korea, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I pronounced it wrong, though. All right. So, uh, big, big day, Jimmy Ryan. Uh, what's happening with you? Any, anything anything, uh, anything happened this morning that caught your eye? Um, I just saw a flurry of uh, tweets and Facebook messages of people fighting with each other. And I was like, oh, today's going to be an exciting day. Today is a fun day. <laughs> today, today, today is a fun day. F- first of all. Today is an extremely important day, and I'll explain to you why that is. And I'm not going to, look, we're not going to bore you with all kinds of mumbo jumbo that serves only to confuse you, make you tap out, and then agree with whatever side it is that the person screaming all this mumbo jumbo is saying. Because that's what happens. Mm. People people start getting lectured by someone who uses a bunch of big words and things people don't understand, and they just go, oh, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. I'm on your side. And they tap out. Right. Eh, that's pretty much it. I'm not going to do that. I promise. i just give you a couple of... Quick reasons why I think today is such an important day. Are we still printing out the entire Affordable Health Care Act and going over it bit by bit? <laughs> yes, <Is> that <laughs> yes, that's what we're doing. <laughs> I'm t- I cannot wait to get out of here. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait. You know, it's like I want to go and buy like a case of beer and just go <laughs> home and sit on my couch yeah. and just watch Fox News all day. It, it is going to be <laughs> the most entertaining I have to say, I've ne- I, I have never, well, I, I'm sure I have at some point, but um, Fox News, it has to have been at least like four or five years since I've even turned it on. It, CNN is almost going along the same pa- pattern. But um, like, I am almost tempted to watch today just because I want to watch what happens, you know, because like it's one of these things where we've been kind of told to believe that there's a huge fight that is uh, political going on right now. And they're going to keep feeding into that today. But really, it is, uh, at least to me, I don't think that anybody's on the right side or the wrong side. If you're talking about liberal conservative, if you're actually making a defining line like that, I think everyone's wrong. When I went to bed last night, I, uh, I, was, I went to bed and you know, I'm doing a little bit of show prep. Don't like to do a lot of show prep late at night. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it late at night. I'm not going to do it like 8 o'clock at night because everything changes. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there's so much new thing. And I, and I, like, to, I like to open up the computer at like 8, 8.30 in the morning and see what's happening. When I went to sleep last night, now last night was a, was a different kind of night for me. I was up very late. I was doing a, a bunch. Actually, I went to sleep very early. I fell asleep at like 9.45 and woke up again at like 12.30. It's awful. So anyway, I go to sleep last night, and I'm nestling in my bed, and I'm like, well, from everything that I've been reading, I guess tomorrow's the day. Uh, I guess uh, I guess one big victory for the uh, the Romney crowd, or whatever you want to call it, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. Okay. And then I wake up, and against what everybody, all the supposed experts last night were, were predicting. The complete opposite happens. What we're talking about is, of course, the Supreme Court upholds the health care law. This was, of course, uh, supposed to be overturned today, if you listen to Rush Limbaugh or Glenn Beck or you Fox what, News. Though? I mean, they were grave dancing last night. Even because uh, I, I haven't watched any of those and listened to any of those. Um, but I mainly, as American news sources go, if I'm going to turn on the TV, it's going to be CNN. And I was even under the assumption that this thing didn't have a chance. Everybody was. Yeah, so even CNN, the White House was. Nancy Pelosi was. Nancy Nancy Pelosi didn't think there was a chance in hell. Yeah. I mean, this was supposed to be the, like one of those final nails that Obama had to get through before the election. It was just another personal humiliation. Right. Doing it for political reasons. Nothing to do with the betterment of society. This is just all about politics. Yeah. I mean, for crying out loud, the guy that they're running basically invented this plan. Yet, hmm. it's the worst thing that's ever happened to America. It definitely would have been, it would have been like a chokehold. To Obama over the uh, you know the election though would have been sure. bad. Yeah. It would have been bad. Uh, Supreme Court upholds health care law uh, in a dramatic victory for President Barack Obama. The Supreme Court upheld the 2010 health care law Thursday, preserving Obama's landmark legislative achievement. This is the greatest. This is so great. All right, first you know what? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell you how the how they how they came down on this. Okay, I'm gonna mm-hmm. give I'm gonna give you exactly what our. Uh, hold on, let me pull up the right one here. Sorry. Um, all right. Here's how the justices vote. We got nine. We got nine justices. Most people thought that it was going to be five four in favor 
of the unconstitutionality of the Obama health care law. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everyone believed that the Supreme Court was going to rule 5 4. There are certain people that uh, were in the bag. Okay? For instance, like, uh, like uh, Ginsburg, she was at uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was thought to be in the bag. Kagan, Elena Kagan was thought to be in the bag for, for the Obama, for Team Obama. Let's put it this way. And boy, I hate doing this because it only compounds the problem that's got me so irritated. Right. But Team Obama thought they had four in the bag. Now there were, you know, at least five other justices. Last night, as everyone was going to bed, nobody thought they had the fifth vote. Nobody thought they had it. They, 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 looked at the, they looked at the other justices up there and their voting record and knowing exactly what their positions are and all that. They figured that there was no way that they were going to uphold this health care bill. Mm -hmm. So here's how it went. The majority, these are the justices who said, this isn't unconstitutional. Are you insane? This is, uh, yeah, this is, this is fine. Okay, that's a little bit of hyperbole there, but you know that, that's basically what the decision said. I would love it. That's actually what the judge came great? out saying. Ah! What are you nuts? I want to read that. I want to read that in Chief Roberts' majority decision. Yeah. That's what I want to read. Eh, what are you talking about? Well, of course it's fine. We gave it a look over. We gave it a look at what? Come on. <laughs> All right. So here are the justices who said yay to it. We got Breyer, Stephen Breyer, old mm. liberal Breyer. We all knew that was going to happen. Ginsburg. Okay, we got the three ladies, okay? The three Las Chicas are all in line with this. We got Bader Ginsburg, uh, Elena Kagan, and Sotomayor, which I love that name, mm -hmm. Sotomayor. Because you get to go mm. at the end of it. Yeah, yeah I, I can't roll my tongue. Something kind of sexy Ooh. about that. Sotomayor. Mm. I, like, I'd, like, I'd like to mix Elena, Elena Kagan, I'd, with Sotomayor. Elena Sotomayor. That's very mm. sexy, isn't yeah. it? That, doesn't that sound like a cartel leader's girlfriend? It does. <laughs> it sounds like the one that you want to have sex with, but you aren't sure if you're going to die yeah. because of it. So, yeah, but you still want to. Yeah. Penelope <laughs> Cruz would play her in a movie. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Mm. Do they have daughters? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, so the majority of decisions, uh, Justice Breyer, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, they were for it. Against it, we had, uh, well, the regulars, okay? Uh, we had Kennedy, okay, Justice Kennedy, mm -hmm. Justice Scalia, Justice Alito, and Justice Thomas. They were against it. By the way, can I just say something about Clarence Thomas that I learned? What's that? It blew me away. Mm -hmm. Made me feel like such a massive failure. First of all, um, I do not subscribe to the popular belief that Justice Clarence Thomas is some kind of complete fool who shouldn't be on the bench. I mean, the guy has been on the Supreme Court of the United States for 20 years, okay? Mm -hmm. What also leads me, and it's the only thing, the only thing that we have to hold against Clarence Thomas is, uh, is the fact that he once put a pubic hair on a Coca-Cola can and he thought it was funny. That's the only thing. You don't know the history of Clarence Thomas? No. <laughs> you know, well, you're too young. Yeah. You're too young. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, okay? Daddy Bush, King George I. He appointed Clarence Thomas at a time when uh, all, all of this divisiveness was really just starting, just really starting to get bad. And it turns out that Clarence Thomas, while he was a, uh, I want to say a law professor, or maybe he was a, uh, no, I know, I think he was probably just a judge somewhere. He had been having a little office fun around the office mm -hmm. and uh, there was a coke can and supposedly uh he put a there was a pubic either there was a pubic hair or something on the coke can that looked like a pubic hair or maybe it was his pubic i don't i don't really remember all of it but i do remember that the I, anita hill you don't remember the anita hill hearings uh, i recognize the name yeah yeah anita hill came out and said that he was basically a sexual harasser mm -hmm. and that he was unfit to sit on the supreme court of the united states and it was a big drawn out thing it went on forever the confirmation hearings were just an absolute blow bloodbath but in the end clarence thomas became justice of the supreme court so so good for him at any rate i don't subscribe to this whole justice thomas sucks and justice thomas doesn't deserve to be there what, what, whether you deserve to be there or not i don't know but this dude was appointed to the supreme court of the united states of america at 43 years old wow that's intense <laughs> I'm 42. Yeah. I'm sitting here wearing a baseball cap, talking about whether or not Selena Gomez is hot or not. And this guy, at the same point in his life, was on the verge of becoming a 
a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. That's impressive. That is. If nothing else, give the fact that he was 43 years old when he was, he worked hard enough in the early part of his career that by 43 he was being seriously considered, not seriously considered, he was confirmed as a justice of the United States Supreme Court. That's impressive. So so please, let's dial down to Clarence Thomas. He's there, he ain't going anywhere. It's a job for life. Stop it. This is why I don't compare myself to people based on age. I hate it. Like hate uh, it. Wikipedia has turned into my enemy when it comes to this things because like I'll come across somebody who's like really famous I'll be like I wonder how old that guy is right you want him to be older than you yeah right. I, and then I'll look at it I'll be like that more? <laughs> I do it all the time I do it all yeah. the time yeah and it kills me you know what else I do I also go to Wikipedia and I'll put 19 the, the year I was born mm-hmm. <laughs> what, 1969 why did what am I a chick why did I pull up on that did you see that like yeah. for a very split second I went I don't want to say how old I am <laughs> no no I'm not, that's not me um, so I'll put in 1969 and I'll go to births and mm-hmm. I'll just look down the list of people who are successful, who are my age, just to determine whether or not it's okay for me to still be cool at my age. Right. Like I'm looking for people who are still cool, you know? You got to find where that line is. Yeah. 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 yeah like, oh, it's cool. You know, I'm, I'm in with guys like John Hamm and Paul Rudd and you know, those guys are still cool. I got a little something left, right? In the yeah. tank. That's not bad. They're Jack good Black. running mates. Yeah. Will Ferrell, I think, is a year older than me or something. But yeah, I mean, look, they've still got you know good group of people. Not too bad. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> no cough button, buddy. Sorry. We're here at the Sunburn <laughs> Summer Beach House. We failed to install a cough button. All right, so once again, the majority decision was uh, uh, Justice Breyer, Ginsburg, Kagan, and Sotomayor. Minority decision was Kennedy, Scalia, Alita, and Thomas. And oh boy, oh boy, it came right down into the lap. The deciding vote had to be Chief Justice John Roberts, who of all the justices was the foregone conclusion. Everybody just knew. They had him in the bank. In the bank, Jimmy Ryan. And he sided with the, "Uh, yeah, Obamacare is not unconstitutional. What is wrong with you people? It is not, again, hyperbole, he didn't really say that, but that's what I think he was thinking. Yeah. And that is what has Fox News and Glenn Beck and... They can't believe it. It's like they thought they had this guy paid off. Right. It's like they thought they had the judge, uh, the bench rigged. They thought it was all taken care of. Oh, well, sure. We can, we can, we can assume that those damn liberals like, uh, like Breyer and Ginsburg and Kagan and Sotomayor, and, uh, we, we assume they're going to vote for it. But we can count on Kennedy, Scalia, Alito, and Thomas. And then, of course, it's going to be a dead heat. And the chief justice... Our guy, John Roberts, is going to come down on our side for our interests. And that's not what happened. Mm. And I'll tell you why I'm so excited about this. Because if, in fact, that was the case, folks, if the United States Supreme Court is bought and paid for by a political party, if, in fact, that is the case, that they can just count on these people to vote along party lines on matters of politics, then we're in a lot of trouble. This really, I really thought that John Roberts was basically just a droid, just Mm. basically a guy that W put in there, Chief Justice. He was going to be a conservative voice as Chief Justice for the next 20, 30 years of his life. I just just assumed that that's how it was going to go. And any of these sort of deal breakers that were going to fall into his lap, he would always side with whatever the conservative party wants. And he didn't do that. He did what a justice of the Supreme Court is supposed to do, and that is eliminate politics entirely from the discussion and look at something on its merits. And John Roberts, who you know he wanted to strike it down, but he knew that historically speaking, he couldn't. He right. knew that he would be look- he was talk- He's looking at his own legacy here. You know, what are they going to say about him 20 years after he's dead and in the ground and no longer the chief justice? You know, Earl Warren, who was chief justice of the Supreme Court in the 70s, he, he receives a lot of criticism for some of the things that he presided over during chief justice. He didn't want to be that guy. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to, you know who he wants to be? Oh, he also didn't want to be Rehnquist, the, the former chief justice, William Rehnquist. He was another guy that was derided after he left, of all of the things that he did. That's why there was such a celebration in certain corners that John Roberts was now going to be the chief justice. Because, oh, we're done with the Rehnquist court. Oh, thank God. I, this, was ju- this is just amazing. It restores my faith in the entire system of government that we have. The, yeah. the, the three major bodies of government working 
I'm sorry, I should restate that. The Supreme Court of the United States is supposed to be independent of the other two. The political wings are supposed to have absolutely no influence over anything that the Supreme Court of the United States does, and today it didn't. Today the Supreme Court did what they're supposed to do. Use their brains. Use their brains as independent thinkers and sometimes vote against what people think you should do based upon politics. I liked his, his quote, and it was right to the point, and it's exactly what I would like to hear from somebody who is on the Supreme Court. He said, I came here to enforce it, not to create the laws. Yeah. And that's exactly what I need my Supreme Court to do. And, you know, the term activist judge was coined by the right. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely what they wanted him to be. Right. They wanted, they're upset that Roberts isn't an activist judge, that Roberts actually went rogue. And my God, if you are going to be surprised when a Supreme Court justice goes rogue, then you have absolutely no idea of what the Supreme Court is supposed to do. They're supposed to go rogue. That's why they're in for life. That's why confirmation hearings of Supreme Court justices are so brutal. Because we're going to put them in there for life, and we have to be absolutely assured that they're going to hold the best interest of the United States Constitution at the highest level. That that is their job, defending the Constitution of the United States, defending the rights protected under the Constitution for the people of the United States of America. That is their job. Not to overturn Roe v. Wade, because there's a bunch of yahoos in Alabama who want to see that struck down. Yeah, I just I wish that uh, the only reason why I think that we were all misled into thinking that there was a, a real competition here is because the media doesn't look at things in as good of a well-rounded way as apparently our Supreme Court is all of a sudden. I mean, like, if they were to actually go through these things and filter it out, you wouldn't have actually believed that there was something that was unconstitutional about it. You no, know what I mean? No, no. Like, the media just wanted to play into that, and we just keep on doing it. And, you know, I said this, too. I said this to you earlier. I, the the only people, and you've probably noticed it. You know, you know who was saying that it was unconstitutional? Glenn Beck, mm. Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, conservative columnists. Do you know who was saying that it was absolutely constitutional? Every legal scholar that ever appeared on TV speaking on this subject, and now the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Sorry, Glenn Beck. Sorry, Sean Hannity. People with a lot more juice in that game have a different opinion than you. And they know what the hell they're talking about. We'll take a break. We'll come back. It is thebarlive.com. PMS, the Pugs Moran Show, for a Thursday afternoon. Back after this.
It's the barlive.com PMS, the Pugs Moran Show for a Thursday afternoon. Jimmy Ryan is here. Hi, Jimmy. How are you? Hey, man. Doing great. We got uh, we got Doug. I don't even know Doug. Doug I met yesterday. He's a good dude. He's hanging out here at the Sunbrew Summer Beach House. And uh, Doug, what is your... What is your Doug came in, he sat down, we started talking. I said, Doug, pull up a microphone. This is what we do here. This is how uh, this is how it works. Hi, Doug. Hi, how you doing? My name's Doug Hoffman. Yeah, we gotta you guys. Get, Doug, we gotta get you on mic there. Well, fantastic. My name's Doug Hoffman. Are you guys doing all right today? We're doing okay. Fantastic. You're a happy guy, Doug. Look at Doug. Look at how happy Doug is. <laughs> Doug's all Doug's all you know what? That's mood. one thing my family always told me, man. They can always look at me and and you know what I'm gonna be happy no matter what I do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, very good. Uh, let's see here. We are talking, of course, about the landmark decision today by the United States Supreme Court, which, uh, uh, again, folks, if you've listened to me over the years, you know that I am not wait, here. What I well, there we go. What I hate about politics is the divisiveness. I'm extremely conservative in some views, but I'm also very progressive in others. Social issues. I happen to fall almost lockstep in line with whatever the pro- progressive agenda is. And that pertains to all of the things that don't affect me and only serve to sort of beat down people who make different choices than I do. Whether that's, uh, whether that's the gay marriage thing. I mean, I don't care about gay. I don't care. I know a lot of gay dudes, right? I'm not gay. <laughs> I'm not gay. It doesn't make me gay knowing a gay dude. Absolutely. It's just as long as he doesn't do it to you. Yeah, we gotta get you on. We gotta get you on there. We gotta get you on. As there. long as he doesn't do it to you, that's well, all right, right. Well, I don't know. Uh, what's he gonna do to me? You know, I mean, it's just an act. I'm not all that concerned about I got, it. I got you. I got you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I have a, a, a in, in my life, I've known a lot of, of guys like that in, in the industries that I've been in, and you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. But the thing is, is, is you gotta look at but, it. He's, we're still not getting them. No, no, you got to talk right into that. Right here. Right here. Okay, yeah. there you go. When you I hear mean, it good in there, you're good in here. I got you. Right. So, you know, it is what it is, right? And people people could choose to live their lives the way they want to live it, right? And, you know, I'm not against anything as long as somebody is not against the way I want to live my life. Exactly. Okay? Exactly. We're Americans. I believe in freedom. <sighs> Isn't that what all right. it's all about? That's However, why we have the U.S. Constitution and what we've done in our lives. That's that's what, what we're all about. So let's talk a little bit more about this health care thing. And I promise we won't do it all day. Although there is just endless, endless subject matter that we can delve into here. Here's, here's what I want to mention, okay? And again, I, I said earlier, this is an important day for all of us, regardless of whether or not you're upset about the outcome here. It's an important day because the United States Supreme Court proved that they were above politics. And they're not in the business of either reinforcing or striking down administration's policies, which is an incredibly dangerous situation. Very dangerous. <laughs> Jimmy, like I was saying to you, I, I, I go, if the Supreme Court had done this, this is the signature piece of legislation from the Obama administration. If the Supreme Court had just decided that, you know what, eh, it's gone, this president shouldn't be allowed, then why did we elect him? And by we, I mean the collective we, because he got a majority, okay? He won more votes. We collectively, the people of the United States of America, elected Barack Obama. This is one of the things that he said he was going to do. Now, I have never been a fan of this particular health care bill because it doesn't go far enough. I wanted the public option. But because he knew that that was never going to get passed, or actually I disagree with that. I think that could have gotten passed mm-hmm. if they were willing to have the fight over it. But this was very early on in his, in his, uh, in his uh, administration, and I don't think that he really wanted to go burning bridges that early. Well, that was a severe miscalculation because it wouldn't have mattered anyway. He burned every bridge, at least in the eyes of his opponents. He, there was nothing he was ever going to be able They weren't going to go, you know what, I appreciate the way he softball pitched us on that health care thing let's take it easy on that didn't happen doug him, That's, him swearing see, what in you're, kind what of you're looking at gentlemen what you're looking at is you know he's the one president that has been very 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 aggressive on what our previous administration didn't do right and he brings hollywood into the act which he has a very very big hollywood following anything that he really wants to project in his administration, he has Hollywood back that up, right? People draw to stars. People listen to people that have influence and uh, that are affluent in this country. So is the basis of his program for the health care wrong? No. 
It's not. The bass is not wrong. It's that we need to fine tune it that it will fit this country. Number one, if we if we put this program into effect the way he's got it right now. There's going to be rough edges, and there's going to be a lot of people affected by it. Is the base of what he has right? It is absolutely correct. Canada's had it. There's a lot of countries that have that have allowed their people to get decent health care, decent health care yeah. through their country. We should be, you know what? We should not be excluded in that. Why are we hating on Canada? Canada seems to have all their shit wired up tight. <laughs> you know, Pretty big. They do. They, they seem to have everything working up there. The, the unfortunate thing is, is and I, I constantly talk about this site, Reddit. Uh, basically, it's people from all around the world. And one of the things that I notice is that a lot of times people will ask questions of the entire community or they'll talk about the situation that they're in and people will kind of compare it to the situation that they're having in their country. The only time that someone says that they're having like a serious illness and they can't get taken care of, they're in America. Absolutely. Yes. That's the only time. Because yes. every other time, France, it's, Canada, Europe, uh, England, every single one will go, I'm sorry, we don't know what to do. Let me ask Hold you on, Doug. It's okay. also the only place where if you are 60, 70 years old mm -hmm. and you've been suffering with some illness for 20, 30 years. It's also the only country in the world where the health insurance can say, all right, enough already. You've reached your limit. We're not covering you anymore. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm supposed to live the last 15 years of my life with this debilitating disease? I, 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 it's inhumane is what it is. We live in a- Absolutely. Well, Doug, let me, let me go up on this little rant here because this is something that I really want to get out before we get too far away from this, okay? When I look at the two- Line. So the line has been drawn right down the middle here. When I look at both sides of this argument, here's what I do. I see the president's uh, side, the administration side, which I ask myself, well, who benefits? What's the motivation there? What is the benefit? Who's uh, lining their pockets with uh, some insurance company? No, absolutely not. Well, who's been? Oh, 16 million uninsured people. Okay, so that's who benefits from this plan. The 16 million poor people who right now can't get health insurance. The the other estimated, uh, what was it, 15 to 20 million people who have pre-existing conditions who cannot get any help. Those are the people, sick people, okay? People who need help. Those are the people that are benefiting from this administration's plan. Now I look over at the other side. What is the opposition? Who's benefiting from the opposition's point of view? And once again, it's the major health care carriers, it's the major corporations, it's the businesses who are now gonna have to, <laughs> so it all comes down to a question of civility. Do we live in a civilized society or not? Because in a civilized society, everything is not about what the top 1% makes on their bottom line. A civilized society is about making sacrifices so that our brothers, so that our neighbors can also have a decent life. It's about giving of yourselves. It's about... Go ahead, Jimmy. You, you seem to be jumping at something. Yeah, well, no, the, uh, the thing is, uh, the thing that I don't like about this bill is that the, the health insurance There's a lot companies, not to like. There's yeah. a lot not to like. The health insurance... I like the There's decision more... Not to I, like. <laughs> I like the decision of the Supreme Court far more than I actually like the bill. Yeah, I, I, the, it's just you get... Basically, these health insurance companies have never gotten people like me, who, you know, 28, 27, especially right. earlier... Because I mean, like, I might be able to get by this year without dying. You know, I might be able to pull it off. But in this new bill, I'm now paying into this. And at some point, I just know that they're going to find a new way to make even more money off of having more people involved. It's just going to get ugly. And like, uh, at some point, we're going to have to push for even further, uh, especially just a, a, a single payer system. I think because well, we're just going to have to keep pushing. My friend, at 28, yeah. at 20, what about almost Doug? 50, 50 years old? Okay, my mm -hmm. my health. My health um, requirements are much different than yours because mm. I mean I mean I almost double your 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 age, mm. even though I may not you know I may be a little bit overweight, but I don't <laughs> I don't look at that, that that I'm that unhealthy more unhealthy than you are. Mm. Okay, what I like about what Obama's done, the only thing, and I'm going to preface that because the only thing that I what, like what he's done, he's he's brought this out into the forefront. Okay, and. He's going to get things passed based on um, a lot of celebrities that that have that have endorsed his word, okay, and endorsed his project, which is great, okay. Now, do I think he'll probably be reelected? And based on what everything he's doing, yes, okay. 
Do I think there's an opposition? Do I think Mitt Romney's going to be able to bring his package into this thing and give the Americans the health care that they deserve? No, I don't. Not at this point. Okay, that's down the road. Um, Mr. Obama has been the aggressive guy that he promised he'd be. Has he made all the right decisions? You know what? I'm. I, you know what? I may be a a a, a big um, proponent and a majority on on what he does, and I may speak out on that. But there's a lot of people that are the silent majority that won't speak out that agree on what he's doing. Okay, we well, will not know that issue. until election day. It, we it, won't. It's a complicated issue, and a lot of people. That's why you have the popularity of things like uh, Fox News and the daytime conservative talk shows, because people, the average person, doesn't have the time between paying their bills and working their job and taking the kids to practice and all that stuff. They don't have the time to actually be as up on this as they possibly can, but they know it's important. So what they do is they get a Cliff's Notes version <laughs> from people like <laughs> Fox News who, who funnel it through whatever funnel it is that they want people to believe. So it's never, whatever you get cliff notes, it's always, there's always an agenda there. There is an agenda with Glenn Beck. There is an agenda with Rush Limbaugh. So that's the problem with the issue. People don't really understand the issue, but they trust folks like Limbaugh and Beck and Hannity and O'Reilly and, and Ben Susteren and all these people. They trust these people to tell them what they should believe. And that is just an embarrassment. It's drive time sensationalism, brother. It's an embarrassment. <laughs> it's an embarrassment. All right, so here's what we're talking about. Once again, a 5-4 split among the uh, Supreme Court justices upholding the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, again, the majority, people voting for it, Justice Breyer, Ginsburg, Kagan, Sotomayor, and Chief Justice Roberts was on the side of the majority, actually wrote the majority decision. What does this mean for people? Okay, just we'll nutshell it. It means that more people are now going to have access to health care. I mean, not now. And again, here's the other thing. This doesn't take effect for another couple of years. Okay, so it's not like... What about the people that are going to find if they don't agree with it? Well, okay, that's a very complicated issue, and I can't <laughs> wait to see the first person who gets prosecuted for that. No one's ever going to be prosecuted for that. Oh, no, that's complicated. Let's not get into that, but that's one of the talking points that the right is throwing out there mm -hmm. just to scare people because, again, when the facts aren't on your side, you have to scare people with sensationalism to get them to believe what you're telling them. No, right I think on. I think this is like no nothing more than just like a necessary stepping stone towards a single payer system, because it's just not going to work. <laughs> it's just not going. to You can't get all the people who have pre-existing conditions in and then have them basically paid off by the younger generation who are now paying into this system, right. who aren't going to be paying in and also aren't going to be prosecuted if they don't. See what I mean? So all of a sudden, that whole system is not going to work. You're going to have to do something else. And, and it's also good, you know. Let's just say here in the. I mean, we're broadcasting for the state of Texas. Let's just say in the state of Texas and the counties here, what what hospitals that are affluent, affluent hospitals in affluent areas that 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 have a big following, which one of those are going to most likely accept this, and which ones aren't? Okay, and then we've got our our bigger hospitals that actually in here in here in Dallas, Texas, we've got our bigger hosp hospitals that are going to accept these people no matter what, right? But the criteria of this healthcare needs to be same, be the same across the board, no matter what hospital you go to. You should be able to get the same care, the same thing, and, and you know if this thing's going to work. Am I Wait, correct? Wait, what? What are you What are you talking about? The same care? I'm a rich guy. I should get better care than a poor guy. Well, that's the attitude, though. Exactly. That's the attitude. All right. Here's what else Do you it means. Disagree or agree no? No, I, I I agree. Uh, it means that uh, uh, more people are going to have access to health care. It means that insurance companies, and this is so important. Yeah. This is so important. It means that insurance companies can no longer disqualify someone for a pre-existing condition. Bad enough that you already got some condition that's awful. Now it's being made worse. Because the insurance, see, the insurance company likes you to pay your premiums every month and them not have to pay for anything. Right. That's what they like. Which that's their, their world go round. That's their business model. Exactly. Right? Just take money, take money, take money, and never pay anything out. That's that's basically what the business model of the insurance agencies are. So they have all of these cockamamie rules like, okay, um, oh, you know what? We're not going to allow you to be covered because you were sick a couple of years ago. 
and uh, we may have to actually pay you back some of the money that you're paying in, so we're not going to cover you. All right, no longer is that going to be allowed. Dependent coverage, this is another big one. Dependent coverage age is now raised to 26 years old. That's huge. This is huge because a 26-year-old in 2012 is not what a 26-year-old was in 1962. All right? The baby boom generation has flooded the workplace. They are staying longer and they are living longer, which means that when you're 18, you're not making the kind of money that maybe you were once when you were 30. And at 26, you're now basically working the kind of jobs that people did at 18 and 17 years old. 26-year-olds many times are still in school. They're working menial jobs. They have no health insurance because they're no longer on their parents' plan. Well, now... Now, up to 26 years old, you can. 26, when I was 26, look, it's a different world, okay? There are no jobs for 26-year-olds because 65-year-olds aren't retiring anymore. They're uh, staying until they're 70. I would have done it. anything for that. You know, because I actually I turned 26 that when that law was <laughs> started throwing around. I was like, are you kidding me? I just went through the last eight years <laughs> right. without insurance because of this. It's all about timing. I mean, my son, my son who's worked in the corporate world for, for quite a while, okay? Um, and he works for a big corporation here in Dallas, and which I'll rename uh, nameless. But, you know, he's got good health insurance, right? Well, when you turn around and he looks at his dad, who's basically been an entrepreneurial you know entrepreneur most of his life going dad how, how you know how are you going to cover these these type of health issues that you that might come down the pipe for you and i said you know what son it's all relative in this country it is all relative in this country we need to have some type of health care that covers everybody in in, in in their time of need in health every okay? other country in the world seems to agree with that except us exactly pugs you said something different i mean really cool right now about the health insurance companies what they'll cover and what they won't. All right. Hey, I'm gonna. Let, I'm. You know, I've got some friends of mine here in town that are big time con contractors and roofers. Okay. They look at these health insurance companies. I mean, these health and and these insurance companies right now. Going, are you going to pay this claim? No, we're not going to pay pay this claim because you got a hail down here and you don't have a hail down over here. But you've been paying premiums all your life. It's all about the premium, mm -hmm. right? Right. It's all about building their wealth. Right. And not letting go their assets. Right. Okay. So you've got somebody that, that, you know, a homeowner, most of you guys, I would think most of you people out there are, are, are homeowners and you look at it that you're trying to, you're trying to file a claim and you can't get a claim because of the regulations that the health insurance have, have set. Okay. You know, it's the same thing in healthcare. You know, Doug, same thing. talking about the healthcare uh, insurance companies, the healthcare companies, uh, they're not consistent in, in that either though, because, Healthcare companies are being short sighted in their resistance towards preventative health measures. They don't even want that. You would think in the long run, I mean, studies have proven that when you detect something early on, it's less of a problem right. for the health insurance down the road. You have a, a lump in your balls or something, and you don't <laughs> go and take care of that because you're not insured. Three years later, you know, when, when you're sick and you've lost 80 pounds and you can't figure out why, mm -hmm. now you're really going to cost the health insurance company. Exactly, so you would, and you're you going to cost your family as well because they got to bury you. You would think the health insurance companies <laughs> would be cool with cover, covering the $200 doctor visit, the initial visit to get mm -hmm. you taken care of, than they would the $50,000, $100,000, dollars $200,000 in long-term cancer treatment costs that they're mm -hmm. going to have to pay. But they don't because they're short-sighted. It's like, they, it's they, like, they don't care about about the long-term goal of everything. They just care about the bottom line at the end of this quarter. It's like Pugs, my long-term doctor that I've had since I've been 13 years old. Very, very smart surgeon. Um, and I won't, I won't uh, lead credence to his name on this show, but he stopped taking insurance. Why? Because the insurance companies won't pay him for the treatments, the correct treatments that he's given these patients, right? They are forced to file their own insurance with him okay, yeah. if they want him right yeah and there's a lot of doctors in these days and ages that, that this day and age that are going towards that you know what the insurance company is not going to pay me for my for my expertise and what i went to school for what i had what you know what i've gotten as far as my you know uh my speciality in, in my medical profession and they're not going to pay me for that then the then the client is going to pay that if you want that, okay? Mm. So we 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 have to figure out something that's fair, actually fair for these doctors. Or you know what? 
if we don't, we won't have doctors to service these people because we're gonna they're gonna start dropping like flies. They're gonna start doing. They've already made money. They're all they're all gonna fly to separate ends of this country and say, you know what? I am not gonna do my profession unless I'm paid for it. So there's two different sides to this, right? Am I correct? Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. So there's the insurance companies dictate sides. that. <laughs> the, right. the insurance companies dictate that, right? Mm-hmm. Then you've got a, a brand new doctor coming out of medical school. And he's trying to set up his his residency, and then he's going to set up his practice, right? Well, of course he's going to take insurance company money. He's going to build his practice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you've got guys like my age right. that are in their 50s right now that are very good in what they do in their field. And to be able to, to go ahead and get a doctor like that, you're going to have to pay over and above what the insurance companies are willing to pay. Yeah. Okay? To get a decent doctor. I hope that makes sense because it's the truth. Yeah, it's it's very complicated, and and there are so many. I, I'm trying to stay away, Doug, from the the minutia issues and just try and stick with the the bare essentials of right and wrong in right. this whole thing. I, I just I just see it. Well, here I'll tell you what. The last one that I want to give here uh, benefits that uh, this bill will do is there are no longer, and I made reference to this earlier, no longer a lifetime cap on benefits, which means the insurance companies can no longer say to you, "Jesus, you've been sick for twenty years. We're cutting you off." What the hell is that? <laughs> exactly. How inhumane <laughs> is that? I mean, seriously, we we have drifted so far away from just what the core human value should be. You bet. We are all just individuals trying to get out. You know, every squirrel's got to get his nut. That's what everybody is thinking. And that is why there is a breakdown in civilization. That is why we have so many problems, because nobody thinks of us as a society anymore. Everybody simply thinks about themselves on their side of the eight foot privacy fence we have a breakdown in society nobody can do you remember when hillary clinton wrote the book it takes a village yes ma'am. Do you yes sir. okay so the idea behind it takes a village is that we all need to be responsible for one another's children when you see kids in the neighborhood acting foolish we should all take it upon ourselves to be, and I'm not talking about spanking kids, but you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. It is the responsibility of the society as a whole or the village to make sure that everybody is raised right and every child is taken care of. Boy, when that book came out, that entire notion was demonized. The idea, that's when I started to see us completely break, when society started to really break down, when you could demonize the idea of being involved in your community's children's lives. It was kind of scary, yeah. It was frightening. She was made to look foolish. In, in history, of course, uh, this is 20 years now, history of, has, has proven that she was absolutely right, and those idiots that were knocking it down and poking fun now look the fools that many of us thought they were back then. The other thing, that is an example of the pure breakdown of society. Now, full disclosure, everyone who listened to the show back then knows that I was not a Barack Obama supporter. I backed John McCain. I was a McCain guy. I've always been a McCain guy. I like McCain. But when they started making fun of the fact that Barack Obama was a community organizer, when did that become a bad thing? When did giving back, when did telling a big Manhattan law firm that was offering you a major league six figure deal that no, I don't want that, I'm going to go and work the next 10 years with a bunch of poor kids in the inner city of the south side of Chicago, when did that become a bad thing? When was that something that you would go, that guy, that guy, he's horrible. Did you see what he did? He turned out all that money to go and help and work with kids in the inner city. When did that become a bad thing? And a lot of people said, you know, the guy's a fool for doing that, right? No, he's, uh, it shouldn't have become a bad thing. He's a fool by the standards of someone who's only concerned about their own bottom line. But by the standards exactly. of someone who is looking for exactly. people to step up and make an impact on society, he wasn't a fool. He was doing the right thing. He was, if my son, if my son, who is three years old right now, came to me at 19, 20 years old and said, Dad, I want to take a year off from college because I want to go work in the inner cities. I want to do this. I want I would be so proud. I would be, I, absolutely, son, and you know what? I'll even pay for it. If I could, I'll even pay for you. Just go ahead. Do that because it's giving back. 
It's, exactly. It's, it's about fixing everything that's wrong yeah. in society and not just drawing the blinds and double bolting your door and making sure that your gun is loaded because that's the world we live in and that world sucks. That world is awful. Doug, thank you. We need to take a break here at the you top bet. of the hour. Thank you, sir. Doug will be stopping by from time to time. And that's going to be it. Okay, I promise. That'll be it on the whole healthcare thing. But <laughs> man, I got to tell you, I'm so proud to be an American right now. I am so proud that the Supreme Court of the United States got out of the politics game. And they actually just looked at something on merits. And a guy like John Roberts, Roberts, who once again, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who was all but counted as a member of the right wing, the conservative faction of the court, the guy they had in their pocket, it came down to his decision, and he went the other way. He went in the direction of what is right and what is decent and what is better for society. And at the same time, basically told all you idiots who pretend to be constitutional scholars that there was nothing unconstitutional about this health care plan. We'll take a break and come back. It's thebarlive.com. PMS, Pugs Moran Show, on saidbarlive.com. Thank you, gentlemen.
Podcast, The Bar Live. Barlive.com. Pugs Moran, the PMS show for a Thursday afternoon. Jimmy Ryan is here. Hey. <sighs> okay, last thing. <laughs> All right, last uh-huh. thing on healthcare. I know I said that we weren't going to talk about it, but I'm tired of everybody just accepting absolutely ludicrous scenarios and just going, eh, well, well. And what I'm talking about here is, you know, I, I was a little bit late getting here today because the president was going to speak on this historic day that the United States Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of Obama's health care. And, uh, you know, Romney was going to give a speech and then Obama was going to give a speech. I think Romney went first. Which, I mean, you know, it's strange. Why didn't the presidents of the United States go first? Romney well, had one out five minutes later. But, you know, they sit and they wait for one another. Right. They're, I mean, that's a, that's a tactical decision. Mm-hmm. It just seems to me that Romney should have offered a dissenting opinion after the president, you know, gave whatever speech he was going to make. I, unfortunately, did not get to say either because I had to jump in the car and I had to run here. Tried to find it on the radio. Uh, historic uh, thing like this. Couldn't find it anywhere on, on AM radio. Because the only thing on AM radio is Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck and crazy preachers here in Texas. Have you ever heard those guys out in the middle of the day? AM radio. They're probably still talking about uh, we just made it to the moon. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're, they're still doing the moon landing. Yeah, they're talking about how disappointed they are with Chief Justice John Roberts, I'm sure. Um... <clears throat> But this whole thing, this whole thing really is not about health care. It's not about the issue. It's about are you Obama or are you Romney? It that's is why political. I that's why I won't call this Obamacare. I won't call it Romney care. It's the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> that's see, what it is. See, but that's the thing. When I say that people just accept absolutely ludicrous scenarios, Mitt Romney got up and he had a podium that said, Romney, 2012. Repeal Obamacare. The gall on this guy. I mean, we all know that Obamacare is Romney care. It's essentially the, 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 the building blocks that Mitt Romney put into effect as governor of Massachusetts is the model design that the president's administration used to make this horrible piece of legislation. Yet, Everybody who's on Team Romney doesn't want to address that. They just, they want to totally ignore that. It was literally the only thing of substance that the people of Massachusetts appreciate about what Mitt Romney did during his time as governor there. It is the only thing. He put a lot more people in coverage than had ever been covered before in that state, and they love it. And unfortunately, because the sitting president used that model for his own plan, which has been demonized by everybody who is opposite President Obama, Mitt Romney has to campaign and run away from the only thing that he did. And now he gets up on TV and he talks about how awful it is and how terrible it is and how it's going to ruin America when he thought it was just fine for the state of Massachusetts. But I mean, Romney does have that magic etch-a-sketch that he's able to pull out every once in a while from <laughs> mm-hmm. his magical underwear and just sketch it away. But doesn't that it all goes b- away? Why doesn't that bother people? I mean, why we have don't- short-term memory. I mean, like I know that that's supposed to be a pot thing, and I'm supposed to be the only one who actually has that. But I think that it's an American <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, no, it's because we really don't care about the substance. We just want the guy we think looks better in the suit. That's what we want. People vote for the guy that they want better for whatever reason. But and then uh, I, you know, I, a lot of people want to go. Well, you know, it's just pure racism. They don't want a black guy. I'm not going to go that far. I mean, I, I, I'm certain that there are certain people who absolutely. Well, I remember people hated Bill Clinton. He wasn't a black guy. You know, he was just a Democrat, and that's what this is about. But, but even then, they were calling him the uh, first black president. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you know, can't even win if you're white. <laughs> if you're sympathetic, it just doesn't work. I saw this other guy. I was telling you about this guy. He was on the steps of the Supreme Court. He's, he's uh, one of the lobbyists or something or some spokesman on behalf. It's from Dothan, Alabama, Jimmy. Mm. It's called Big Jim McBob from Dothan, Alabama. He makes widgets down there, employs 900 people. 
Widgets? Wait, he makes widgets. For like the computer? I don't know. Widget. No, I don't know. No, widgets. <laughs> widgets. The old default term for something nondescript that someone okay. might make. Just widgets. He makes you know, something. <laughs> I don't know what he makes. I don't remember what he makes. I, I, look, I'm lucky I remember Dothan, Alabama. I'm just imagining this uh, Bubba guy making Windows widgets for his computer. <laughs> right. He's got 900 people in Dothan doing it for him. I made a clock. No. So uh, Big Jim McBob gets up on the steps. And we're talking to him on CNN. And he says, oh, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, this is, uh, is going to set back the United States manufacturing industry by 20 years. I'm going to have to take my company and move it overseas. And because of this decision today, 900 people in Dothan, Alabama are going to lose their job. What? <laughs> what? Do you hear what the guy just said? The guy said, because he's not going to make as much money as he's making now, he would rather put 900 people in Dothan, Alabama out of work, 900 American citizens, he'd rather put them out of work than actually just have to pay a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And he's making it seem like we should all feel sorry for him. You're the one that is putting those 900 people out of work, not this health care plan. You, Big Jim McBob from Dothan, Alabama, are the one deciding to move your manufacturing operations to an overseas country. That's your decision. You're doing it because you know what? You're probably going to make just a little bit less under this new plan. You're still going to have your multiple country club memberships. You're still going to have fancy cars and a summer home on the Gulf. But you know what? You're not willing to accept that. You're not willing to accept any sort of give back to society as a whole, even though this plan will benefit the people in Dothan, Alabama. But you're going to put them all out of work. You're going to put them all out of work rather than suffer some effect to your bottom line. And that, the fact that nobody would call this, the fact that this guy felt emboldened with this idea, that everyone was universally going to see his point of view, is an incredibly obvious example of what is wrong with the way people think in this country. I, I, I just wish that people like that would have to actually move to Taiwan, where they're going to move their new factory to. You know, they actually have to live amongst the people. <laughs> why not have that? Yeah, go ahead. Bob, All right. why don't you go move to Taiwan then? You know what? I hope that everyone in Dothan, Alabama, burns this son of a bitch's home down, and he has to move to Thailand, <laughs> yeah. or wherever the Bangladesh, or wherever the hell yeah. it is that he's going to go move. Because you are a scumbag. You want to talk about other people being traitors and anti-American? That's about the most anti-American set of ideals I've ever heard. You're going to put 900 people, 900 Americans, out of work because you're going to make a little less money. Well, you're a businessman. Figure out how to make up the difference. You're not going to go broke. Nobody's going to break you. Mm. But, you know, he gets applauded, I'm sure, by many people, which I think is very funny. (laughs) Yes, people who don't think through the issue. All they do is see a big, fat hillbilly on the steps of the Supreme Court with a fancy watch and a nice suit on talking about how this is going to put 900 people out of work in Dothan, Alabama. No, you, you are the one that is going to put 900 people out of work. This bill doesn't put anyone out of work. This bill insures people. Bill, I'm sorry, it's not a bill. This law. So it's just, I mean, there's a, there's a complete breakdown in decency in society. It's happening, you know. And it, people just seem to be embracing it, almost happy about it. I mean, the, the craziest part was, and, and while I am totally, uh, I totally understand a lot of his policies, a lot of his thought. I like his, uh, his uh, um, uh, 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 foreign policy especially, but Ron Paul, I don't think even the Ron Paul people realize what that would mean for them. Ron I mean, Paul like, that is was pretty insane. Intense. I mean, yeah. I mean, Ron like, was, Paul is insane. Yeah. I mean, like, when you really think about what that would do to your day-to-day routine, Ron Paul getting what he wanted, it would have been crazy. (laughs) These people look – you know what my deal breaker with Ron Paul is other than the fact that just about – other than the fact that he's a small-town doctor who's never really been out in the world, he's spent his entire life in the same 10-square-mile area, knows absolutely nothing 
about what happens in big cities, knows absolutely nothing about what happens with minorities. He doesn't. Oh, Ron Paul has delivered plenty of little Mexicano babies over the years. Okay, well, that's great. So, you know, he's not a complete monster. He sees a pregnant woman in need, and he helps her deliver her child. Good for him. A pat on the back. He's not a complete monster. But you know who else do that? Paramedics. People stuck in traffic jams when a lady goes into labor, they might get out of their car and help her deliver too. So it's not some great thing that Ron Paul has actually pro bono delivered Mexican babies. But you know what really bothers me about Ron Paul? Aside from just about everything that he thinks and believes and the fact that he gave the world Rand Paul. I mean, that's another problem. His son, Senator Rand Paul. That guy, that guy, that guy is the male Michelle Bachman, Rand Paul. He is. He's just as batshit loony as Michelle Bachman is. Mm, I don't know. Every once in a while, they'll say something that I, I really appreciate, though. So Rand Paul? Yeah, Rand Paul and Ron Paul. Every once in a while, they'll well, just look, say some really, really smart stuff. They say some interesting things as yeah. it pertains to the libertarian viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But the libertarian viewpoint is not the entire platform that they believe in. They believe in other... There, look, we need... Everything in this country is based on liberty. That's what we're about. But it doesn't mean that everyone is at liberty to do whatever the hell they want, whenever they want. We do have to have certain stop gaps in society. We just do. And therefore abolishing just about everything, which is why they scare me. But the real thing that scares me, and I've got a friend, Jay, who's a big Ron Paul supporter. And Jay's a smart guy, and he's a thoughtful guy, but he's really a big Ron Paul supporter. The thing that I can't get past are the racist newsletters. Mm. You know about these? Sure, yeah. Back yeah. in the early 90s, mm. Ron Paul put out newsletters to constituents and donors, and you know, this is before websites and all that, when you actually got something in your mail. <coughs> And they commissioned writers to fill the newsletter. And they went out and got a bunch of racist writers who wrote things about how the black man is going to rise up. And These are all things that had Ron Paul's name on it 25 years ago. And he has not given me a satisfactory explanation as to why he allowed his name to go on that literature. He says things like, well, I was very busy back then and I didn't read everything. Your own newsletter? You didn't read your own newsletter? You weren't aware of the type of incendiary rhetoric that you were putting out there? Now, sure, it was 1992, and we're different now, but no, no, you're an old man. You believe the same shit you believed in 1992. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure that there's definitely a lot of that. Uh, I just thought that he was a, a nice breath of fresh air when it was uh, coming around the Republican primaries. I like him as a voice. Yeah. I like him as a voice out there. Yeah, and I, I definitely was not wanting him to be a uh, commander-in-chief but I liked him being a guy who was running for commander in chief. No, just man. Because it started a good conversation. No, man, I'm, I'm not a fan of Barack Obama. I'm not a fan of some of the things that he has done. I'm not a fan of what I should say he hasn't done. But, you know, right now we're talking about a two man race between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, and I could never vote for Mitt Romney. Ever. This guy is a complete Johnny Bravo. He fits the suit. He looks presidential. He's a good-looking man. He's a rich guy. To be fair, though, so is Barack Obama. I mean, like, really, in none of, neither oh, I'm of sorry. these guys. He's a good-looking white man. He's a rich guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, but, you know, unless you're racist, that doesn't really work, you know? And I don't, I, I don't, I care to believe that there aren't as many racists as, you know, the TV would like to make you believe. But, I mean, like, it just seems like you would have at least one option who is anti-war. You would think that there would be one. Yeah, you would. You, I mean, would. But you would think that you'd have an option there in was. this election. Well, there was. Yeah. There were but, a lot of people, and they all got dismissed. Yeah, and it's just, and it's because we all knew who our options were a year ago. You, you know, the, the guy who I supported from the very beginning, I'd never heard of him before. I saw him make a speech somewhere, and I went, whoa, I like this guy. I went, I looked up, I researched him, I found out as much as I could about him. Impressed me to no end. He got less than 1%. Huntsman? John Huntsman. I liked Huntsman, too. John Huntsman mm -hmm. is a moderate Republican from Utah, former governor of Utah, who was completely marginalized by everything. And when you listen to this guy speak, do you know this guy taught him? He taught himself Mandarin, Mandarin yeah. and Cantonese. 
It's hard, man. I've, I've actually tried to do that, and uh, I've stopped many times because it's just way too hard. He taught himself. Yeah. He was ambassador to China, and he decided. Uh, did you know that no other ambassador to China actually spoke Chinese until John Huntsman? Really? And John Huntsman went, yeah, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually be the first guy that can actually sit and have a cocktail with these people and talk to them on a human level mm-hmm. and not use interpreters and everything. I mean, he's just an impressive guy. Do you know that John Huntsman dropped out of high school? Really? Oh, you don't know about this? No. John Huntsman dropped out of high school. No, no, he. this is not like, oh, what's he going to do with his life? Look, he had a rich daddy, okay? He was a rich kid. He dropped out of high school to move to L.A. with his band. <laughs> and they got a record deal. Nice. Yeah. It didn't go anywhere. Yeah. You know? And he was back, you know, in Utah doing whatever. But, man, that's 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 an adventurous spirit you know that's now granted he's allowed to be adventurous talking about john huntsman because his daddy had a lot of money you mm-hmm. know it's, it's easy to fail and take chances when you're young in life when your daddy's gonna bankroll all your bad decisions but still i mean he's just a very very interesting guy and i would have totally backed john huntsman against barack obama but you know what they gave us they gave you know we ended up with we ended up with santorum gingrich and romney and yes of those three Mitt romney is the most digestible for my way of looking at things but not more than barack obama i mean i've got a i right now i've got a i've got to go with barack obama mm-hmm. i mean I, I, there's yeah. actually a part of me that was hoping that he he would lose because i want hillary <laughs> next yeah. i want hillary to take a crack at this that woman is impressive yeah, she started the healthcare thing. She'll she'll finish it up. <laughs> you know the thing that really was sad to me about Huntsman was uh, when he was uh, in the primaries. There was that debate, and uh, he ended up deciding that he's gonna go ahead and try to impress the pants off of people. Throw out a little bit of Chinese. Oh, pan over to the audience. No one's impressed. <laughs> no, they're appalled. Why does he speak a communist language? Why would we have a president that speaks a communist language? Uh, yeah, why would we want that? Our same, biggest trading partner. Same people who supported George W. This is my problem with George W. Bush. Uh, the, uh, the direct opposite of of John Huntsman. John Huntsman learned Chinese because. It was he felt it would better him. He felt that it would help him do his job better. And he was curious. And you know what? As Jimmy said, Chinese, not an easy language to learn. But he did it. He showed an aptitude for these kinds of things. But we don't want that. You know what we want? We want George W. Bush, a guy who had never left the country until he was president of the United States. Now, you might think there's a lot of us out there who have never left the country. I mean, we just don't have the means. George Bush was a rich kid. (laughs) George Bush, had he had the intellectual curiosity as a young man to go out and see the rest of the world, had the means to do so. He didn't have the intellectual curiosity. If I had the means, I wouldn't be here right now. Exactly. (laughs) You wouldn't be able to keep me. You know, anyway. I'd be, I'd be in Moscow. Yeah. I'd be in Rome. I'd be traveling the world. I would be seeing other cultures. I would be trying to better myself because I don't believe that the world begins and ends with the American way of life. I would like to see the other ways of life. I would like to see what else is out there. If for no other reason, my own personal edification mm-hmm. or education, whatever you want to call it. But isn't that disgusting? Smart is bad. Yeah. Smart. It, 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 the other thing that they've been able to do, it, somehow make somebody who attends and graduates from an Ivy League school a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Really? Well, you know, the Ivy League elite, that's a bad thing? So when your son gets into Harvard, you're going to forbid him from going? I yeah. guarantee you, they What's, don't. They don't tell the accountant that uh, wants to be their new accountant, oh, your Ivy League, not sure that I want you taking care of my money. No, but they pander. The message among certain candidates, among certain political groups, is to pander to the low-hanging fruit, Mm -hmm. and the low-hanging fruit are the people that are stupid, the people who don't think about anything, the people who live their lives in fear, in fear of the new next-door neighbor being the wrong skin color, in fear of somebody coming and taking their job, the fear, just fear in general, the fear of that crazy guy who works at the Shell station with the towel on his head blowing up the shopping mall during the Christmas season. That's what people operate under. And there are certain groups of politicians who make it their lifeblood to pander to them. It 
it's yeah, I, it's just one of those things where you can just see it progressively getting worse and worse. But I think that's also why I've decided I'm just turning off the TV. I'm gonna see how this baby. Oh works no, out. no, see, I'm the direct opposite. I gotta see as much as possible. <laughs> I, I love it. It's I, what keeps me. I drove me... myself crazy long enough. Here's uh, here's something that I saw last night, and and this is I don't want to give too much about myself and have people. Go, oh well, there you go. Pugs just admitted it. I watched Chris Matthews last night at like two o'clock in the morning for the first time in in a very long time. I cannot stand CNN or MSNBC. I just can't stand it. I can't stand MSNBC any more than I can stand Fox News. I don't want my news being delivered by people with an agenda. But last night, Chris Matthews did something that just made me want to vomit. I mean, he didn't do it. Uh, What he showed, an example of someone else doing something that made me want to vomit. Two guys in South Carolina are running for uh, Congress, running against each other. Both Republicans, both do stump speeches right after each other. First guy gets up, goes into this whole thing about Barack Obama, we're going to send him back to Kenya. Okay? All right, that's what he's going with. Woo! Everybody, woo! We're going to send him back to Kenya or whatever country he comes from. Oh, now it's whatever country? Now we aren't sure. Now we aren't sure. Can't be America, but it's whatever. It's some other country. All right, so whatever. So then the next guy that he's running against comes up and he starts saying, look, I know that that birth certificate was produced, but it don't look like my birth certificate and it don't look like any of your birth certificates. So all I'm saying is that we do need the one thing my opponent and I agree on, and that is we are going to send Barack Obama back to Kenya. Woo! Woo! They step off stage. Boom! Instantly interviewed by a reporter with a camera. So you're going back with the birther stuff. Uh, Tell me, you're you're not satisfied with what Barack Obama produced? As soon as both of these candidates got in front of a reporter, Jimmy, they said this. Oh, no, Barack Obama is an American citizen. Of course he is. I'm just saying that there are people out there who have questions. I personally do not have questions. I believe I'm satisfied with what we saw. In other words, when they were up on stage in front of a bunch of inbred morons at some freaking rally, they were telling them what they wanted to hear because they're uneducated, uninformed, and angry. So he was spoon-feeding them, pandering to them. But as soon as someone with a microphone and a camera questioned them about what they had just said, they completely reversed their opinion. Why? Because they know that those people are not going to be reading that newspaper. They are not going to be watching that news. So they're going to have no idea that he just reversed himself. And they both did it. Within 10 minutes of each other, they both completely reversed what they said on their stump speech. This is disgusting. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, though, I mean, as a politician, that's what you do. I mean, like, it, the, the problem here is uh, there was a study that was done, and I think I talked about this one time, but it was basically just uh, they, these scientists made computers create music themselves, right? So, like, it would make its own music and then try to build on top of it. And the computers that were programmed to com- create music themselves didn't do as well as the ones that were programmed to listen to music and add to it. And what it basically ends up teaching you is that the music is made by the people that are listening to it more so than it is by the people that are creating it. And so really what that tells me about politics is that if that asshole wasn't willing to be an asshole and go two completely different directions right in front of us, then somebody else would have. Somebody yeah. else would. Well, there would. And so there'd be just another it's, asshole. But it's because the wrong people are seeking power. Yeah. Leaders. Well, no, 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 no. The wrong people are, they're misinformed and they're looking for somebody right. to have power. Okay, you, you know what? Yeah. I, because my entire point on this that I was ramping up to, and we need mm-hmm. to take a break here, my whole point that I was ramping up to on this is that it isn't them stop blaming the, you know, stop blaming 7-Eleven for offering a big gulp when we're the ones who buy them, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is us, America. Take some goddamn responsibility for the slipshod clown car that we're producing for all these candidates. That's what it's a big clown car that pulls up. And it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. They're going to pander to you. They're going to tell you what you want to know. The onus is on us as Americans to educate ourselves, to get smarter, get better, demand better from our leadership. Don't just think about yourself. Start thinking about society. 
How did we go and have a political show like this today? We'll take a break. <laughs> we'll come back. It's PMS on the barlive.com. It's thebarlive.com, PMS, the Pugs Moran Show for a Thursday afternoon. Jimmy Ryan is here. Also, check out thebarlive.com for uh, YNR Radio did a show last night. How did that go? Yeah, it was good. Very good. And uh, Big Dave and Chloe did their uh, first show yesterday. Big Dave and Chloe. Uh, typically, I would be here for those, but I, I am having horrible, horrible car problems. <sighs> anyway, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll get that figured out. Anyway, uh, yeah, I wasn't here last night. I'm sorry. I didn't even get a chance to hear. I spent the whole day yesterday. My car is overheating because it's, uh, I believe, wait, let me check the temperature. It is 146 out. Yep, 146 degrees right now in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. So my, my car is having, I think I got a hole in a radiator hose. Mm. So it's like, it's all pouring out. So I got to constantly be pulling over and putting more cold water in. I got a trunk that is just filled with cold water. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Just, uh, hey, that's actually kind of nice. You actually get to set it up. Just in case you get stranded, you also have water. Oh, I'm prepared. <laughs> yeah, I'm prepared. Oh, and you want to see something else? All right, look at this. This is what I've taken to doing now. All right. 
So it's summertime. Uh-huh. I don't know if you can see. Can you see that on camera? Yeah. Can yeah. You see? Okay. So I'm I'm wearing flip flops. Flippy floppies. Because I've become a, a lazy man. What do you got? You got open toed shoes? No, I got shoes on today. Well, I'm new to the open toed shoe thing. Do you feel a little awkward with the open toes? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about the my theory on open toed shoes. Uh huh. I was always against them. Uh-huh. I I don't know if you know this about me. I got a problem with toes. Okay. Fair enough. They are a bit weird. Little fingers on your feet. Yeah. Little useless fingers on your feet. Could they could they be maybe a couple inches longer so I could pick up things like a monkey or something like that? I mean yeah. they're just I know they're there for balance, but other than that, I really toes freak me out. They look weird. Mm. They smell. Yeah. That's bizarre. So I never was a fan of and I have this irrational fear of things falling on my feet. And somehow I think that if my feet are covered, then I'll, you know, it won't hurt as much. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I, for some reason, I've recently started just within the, I've had flip, these, this pair of flip-flops for years. And they're not nice. They're not Nike or Adidas flip-flops. They're like five bucks from yeah. the dollar store bin. I've had them for a while. And they just sit there for convenience purposes, and I've never worn them. Eh, about a month or so ago, I went, I'm going to walk the dog in flip-flops. All right. So took the dog on a bit of an extended walk. Feeling pretty good. I'm like, all right, these are working out. I kind of like this. I kind of like the air blowing on my toes. It feels uh-huh. nice. So I've now become a big fan of the flip flop. I've worn nothing but flip flops for the last month. It, it is. It's something that there's something liberating about it because mm. you know your feet are all out there. But, yeah. but at the same time, though, like whenever I'm around my friends, I'm always aware that my feet are more exposed than their feet. You see what I mean? Like that's a bit no, awkward. I for totally me. see what you mean. They're yeah. vulnerable. I don't like my toes being vulnerable. I already don't like my toes. I don't like them being vulnerable. (laughs) So, yeah, I'll be a little bit awkward if I'm the only person with feet exposed. So, anyway, I got the trunk filled with water in case the car overheats. But because I've taken to wearing flip-flops, I've had to put a pair of gym shoes in my trunk Mm. just in case I have to hoof it. Yeah. I don't want to be walking like three miles in 115 degree temperatures wearing flip-flops. One of the funniest things about uh, Jagger from the old show was uh, basically – Every time that you go over to his house, he no matter what he was wearing, no matter how casual he was dressed, he always had ready-to-go running shoes on. And for, it was the weirdest <laughs> oh, thing. Laced up tight. Yeah. I mean, like, at any moment, this thing could yeah. all go down, and he needs to be able to like heel-toe it right out the door, and he's all ready. Right. He's got his go kicks on. Yeah. He's, he's ready to dash. <laughs> all right. I understand. See, that's the other thing. Wearing flip-flop, flip-flops tells the world, I ain't running anywhere. Right. It just screams it. You know, you're not going to have to chase me. I'm mm. not going to chase you. I'm wearing flip-flops. I'm going to do that awkward tumble where the front of my flip-flop gets stuck under oh, my foot. Oh, I've done that. Yeah. I've done that. I, I had a situation just last Saturday where I was walking the dog, and I had my son Mason with me, and Mason took off across the parking lot, and I had to turn, pivot, and run really quick, and I blew out my flip-flop. Yeah. It was like sideways on my foot. I was like, yeah. one flip-flop was all right, and the other one, and as I'm running, the foot that had the sideways flip-flop was basically just on the pavement, yeah. and it was all hot. You know, it was like 110 degrees. I'm like, ow, ow, ow. Ow. Yeah, you can't move quick in the flip-flops. All right, let's get into a little deuce tournament here uh, for a Thursday edition on the PMS show. This is where we like to single out some people in society who are, uh, you know, acting douchey. We determine who is the biggest of the douches. Uh, I'm going to put the... Uh, all right, this is, this is not so douchey. It's a bit of a stretch, I suppose. But uh, have you seen uh, Miami-Dade and uh, Broward counties in Florida has completely... Or, uh, yeah, they've completely outlawed the sale, mm. distribution, whatever, of bath salts. Yeah. Now, now why is this? What, was there an event that happened uh, down there in South Florida that maybe... It was something. I mean, um, there's something about somebody eating another person's face. Oh, the zombie. Uh. That's right, the zombie that was on bath salts. Yeah. Right, and everybody went crazy about bath salts. Bath salts this. Everything that happened in the, in the following couple of weeks that was a bit bizarre was attributed to bath salts. Well, the Miami bath salt zombie, he started this whole thing. Medical, exa- medical examiner's report is out. No bath salts in the zombie system. He was not doing bath salts. Yeah. Somewhere there's a dude that makes his money off of distributing bath salts going, see? Yeah. <laughs> see? <laughs> Starting the big protest movement. Bring back the bath salts. Yeah. Medical examiner Causeway Cannibal not high on bath salts. He did have a little marijuana in his system, though. But again, as a, as a uh, well, let's say as a ex- person who has some experience with marijuana, 
No one in the history of being stoned has ever smoked weed and then ate someone's face. No. No one. <laughs> it has never happened. I suppose you can connect a couple of the details of this story and say, well, this guy, he ate someone's face. He smoked weed. Yes, but not because he smoked weed. If anything, the weed probably tempered his craziness. Yeah, I, this really does creep me out even more because, you know, when he was on well, bath salts. It, it was an excuse. It was nice. It was right. bundled. It was a nice little bow on it. We understood what was going on there. Yeah, and now I, I'm starting to wonder if this isn't something that really is starting to take over. Like if he was just the first one. He's a zombie. First mutation. Maybe he is a zombie. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that makes more sense. The guy is only high on pot. Rudy the zombie Eugene, the Causeway cannibal who ate the face off a homeless man he attacked along MacArthur Causeway, was apparently not high on bath salts or any other exotic street jug at the time of the attack. This according to a report released Wednesday by the Miami-Dade Medical Examiner's Office. He had a bit of Jesus with him too, didn't he? Yeah, he was high on the Jesus. He had mm -hmm. a Bible with him. Yeah. The news leaves law enforcement officials wondering what drove Eugene to strip off his clothes, attack homeless man Ronald Popo, and chew off pieces from Popo's face. Speculation about the cause of Eugene's rampage on Popo's face centered on drugs, specifically bath salts. After police union officials claimed an increase in bizarre behavior among people on the street using such drugs. It's crazy. I mean, like, I would, I would really like to know that he was on bath salts because that was the, that was the time that everything was going on. It was that urban weekend, wasn't it? That was right. uh, going on. So you got a lot of random drugs going on around there. It made I sense. To he was know. partying, you know. Yeah. Because otherwise, you have to actually think, how would I do this totally sober? And there's no way I can think. I can, I can't wrap my mind around that. Oh, speaking of the mind. Yeah. The, the mind. I've, I've always said this. I, the, the human body is something that we take for granted. It is so complicated. It is so, I mean, look, the, the mere fact that I have gone uh, 40 some odd years of my life without having any kind of major breakdown in parts, you know? Right. I haven't blown a kidney. I haven't, you know, anything like that. I, no lumps have formed anywhere. Knock on Formica or whatever the hell this is. <laughs> Because it is so simple for those things to go wrong. I don't want to get maudlin here, but it was really driven home when my son died. My son was a perfectly healthy baby. Everything was fine. There was nothing wrong with him. And then at the moment of birth, everything went haywire. Mm. And they still don't know. They, they still don't know what exactly went wrong. Mm. But he died. Because the human body is incredibly complicated. Yeah. And, and we want to believe that doctors have the answers for everything. But doctors don't. They're just investigators. Doctors are just investigating things, and they're using education, experience, and their best professional judgment to determine a theory on what happened. And I'm not talking about it in my son. I'm talking about it in any diagnosis, anything. Watch House. You'll see what a crapshoot it is. Well, and just for us to get here, one of the things that was really crazy in, uh, in Darwin's books was he would talk about how he was told all of his life when he was growing up that everything was kind of put together. Everything's put together perfectly. Everything sets off perfectly. Everything's going to be nice and rosy. And when he finally ended up having the money to go out and, like, see how nature behaved when it wasn't around humans, you know, like, actually get to see it in the, in the raw, he was like, wow, this is really ugly. I mean, like, these people, like, these animals are just having to survive. Right. I mean, like, there's nothing about it. I mean, like, there, it's just if you're able to survive, you will. And then that's what started making him realize that this thing is an ugly process getting to where we've been already. Like, a lot of things had to go wrong for humans to be where we are now. Yeah. yeah but also, it also speaks to something I was saying earlier. It is the difference between civilized behavior and feral behavior. Mm -hmm. you know, animals are feral. They're wild. They're uncivilized. They don't have any sort of interest in the well-being of the people next to them. That's why we're the best. That's why we humans are top of the food chain. Because we do have that. We do have an ability to recognize the greater good around us. That's what civilization is. Well, as long as everything's in place. If, if, if nothing's in place, we become just as animalistic. I mean, like, yeah. if, if, if everybody's hungry, they don't give a damn about the person next to them. A, a breakdown in civil behavior leads to still a society, but an uncivilized society <laughs> yeah. like you have in an ant colony. Right. Or, or a beehive. Yeah. That's an uncivilized society. It's a society. It's a bunch of things living together and coexisting, not peacefully, but coexisting. All right, story two here on the Douche of the Day tournament. Uh, this one I love. This, this, uh, you know, Facebook and 
everything's being recorded and everything's being put up on Twitter and uh, people just don't think. Yesterday we talked about the school bus monitor who was brutalized by the 12 year olds hurling insult after insult and they all felt comfortable enough with what was happening to record it and place it on their Facebook pages because again it's all about people's personal universe. Kids Facebook pages, they believe, is their own personal universe. They don't understand that there is a window that is wide open to the rest of the world on their social networks or whatever. This girl, this is, this is a great story. Uh, as mentioned by the BBC News recently, a 17-year-old girl was visiting her grandmother in Sydney, Sydney, Australia, when she took a picture of a large sum of cash while helping her grandmother count her savings at home. Do you know this story? No. The teenager posted the picture on her Facebook feed around 4 p.m. on Thursday, May 24th. So grandma doesn't trust the banks or whatever. So she's keeping her life savings in her mattress or whatever, wherever old people like to keep it. Just as safe. (laughs) Not really. But I I, look. I'm going to walk with you down that path, yeah. but not, not really, yeah. you know, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. So she's playing with all the money, hundreds and hundreds. I'm seeing a picture of it here. Hundreds and hundreds of dollar bills just piled up. So the girl took a picture of all the money at her grandma's house and put it on Facebook at four o'clock in the afternoon. 10 o'clock that night, armed gunmen broke into the house looking for the money that she posted on Facebook. <laughs> Wow. Wee! <laughs> now that, <laughs> now that is funny. That is funny. That is a 17-year-old girl. Come on, have a little bit of sense here. So, uh, again, at 4 p.m. around Thursday, May 24th, she posted it up on her Facebook fa- feed. Approximately seven hours later, two masked men armed with a wooden club and a knife entered the girl's family home 75 miles away in the town of Bundendan. Upon entering the family home, the men found the 47-year-old mother of the girl as well as a 58-year-old man and a 14-year-old boy, likely her father and brother. When speaking to the family, the two men wanted to talk to the girl about the sum of money in the picture that was posted on Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But apparently they went to her home, Um, and she was at Grandma's. Okay. So the money was at Grandma's. Yeah, I mean, if... Some one of her Facebook friends is an armed robber. Mm Mm-hmm. And it, well, all you have to know is, uh, like, whenever you take a picture with your phone, it's not just taking a picture and making that the uh, the file. Um, inside of that is embedded encoded information. So, like, if you use a program and take any picture off the Internet, you can find out data as to where that was taken, where it was posted oh. first. Yeah, so if you I mean, know what like, you're doing, sure. Yeah, so, I mean, like, uh, just because you put it on Twitter doesn't mean that it's only going to put out the information that Twitter puts out. The data is hard-encoded into the actual picture, so... You don't even have to be a Facebook friend. If somebody shared that picture with you, you can find it. You can get the information right off of the picture. Hmm. So. All right, here's one, uh, another one. Jackie R. Witten had been a six year employee at the Big Apple convenience store until a single transi- transaction sent her job up in smoke. The store clerk was fired after she refused to take a customer's EBT card to pay for cigarettes. Now, I guess the EBT card is a form of state welfare, okay? The store clerk was fired uh, for refusing to uh, accept the EBT card as payment for the cigarettes. Witten said, this is the woman who was fired, said a young man came in the store to buy two packs of cigarettes on May 29th. When she asked him for ID, he handed her his EBT card. EBT cards are used for both food and cash assistance programs. There are two types of cards. One can be used for food. The other can be spent on anything and used just like a debit card. Witten said she did not think EBT cards could be used to purchase cigarettes and refused to sell them to him. Two had a little go around as the line got longer behind him, said Witten. This is the clerk. Here's what she said. I made the statement to him and all the people in line, do you think myself, that lady there, and that gentleman over there should pay for your cigarettes? And he said yes. The next day, Witten said the customer uh, came to the store to complain. Witten received a call later that day from the parent company of the convenience store where she works, telling her it had received a complaint about her and reprimanded her for it. Witten then said, I would bow out gracefully, Oh, I, uh, that's when the clerk said, look, 
I was I decided to bow out gracefully and quit my job, give my notice because I didn't want to be a part of this system. I'm 65 years old, you know, said Witten. Charles E. Wilkins, the GM of this particular store, said the EBT cards in the cash phase could be used for any items, including alcohol, tobacco, and gambling. Wilkins. Gambling? Anything. Anything. Can be used for anything. Oh, Wilkins said the company gave Wilton the option of staying, but she said she would not accept the cards anymore, and they said, all right, then you're fired. This is a complicated one. This is a complicated one. Because from the gut... You want to say, these people are getting this assistance and now are paying for their cigarettes and they can even pay for lottery tickets if they want. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. Look, I'm very, un- I'm very uncomfortable with that, too. Yeah. I- I'm very uncomfortable. Is with there that. really an argument for giving people cigarettes and alcohol? Yeah. The, really? ar- the argument is this. This busybody woman, a 65-year-old clerk at a convenience store, doesn't have the right to enact opposing policy to what the state has legislated. Well, but she, she does thought, not have. Nope. She thought that that was the the way that it worked, though, right? Well, she believe. I don't believe that because she okay. obviously had had to charge other suspect things i'm certain she'd worked there for 20 years this probably Mm. wasn't the first time someone came in with this now i personally happen to be against that i i don't think that these welfare things should be allowed to pay for alcohol and cigarettes and all that stuff I, i but they do but they do and it isn't the point or it isn't the it isn't the job of a 65 year old cashier to tell somebody who is legally entitled to have this card by the rules of that land. Again, folks, this isn't what's right. It's what is. This woman had no right to do this to this guy. Now, I personally, I happen to agree with her. I don't think that we should have to pay for this guy's cigarettes. But you know what? That fight is to be taken up at the state house. Yeah, and maybe now it will, though, because she she, maybe made, it will. she made an issue of it. I, I think, I, you know what? Yeah, she may be a douche, but you know what? Good. I think that he should feel bad about the fact that he had to stand in front of a bunch of people who realized that they were going to be paying for his cigarettes and realize he's not getting his effing cigarettes. This is a complicated one. Yeah, believe me, I understand what you're saying. I just as have well, a, I just have a hard time with individual citizens who have a specific political agenda mm-hmm. forcing their point of view on people who aren't doing anything wrong. They might be doing something ethically wrong. You know, you might have a problem with it on that level. But legally, they're allowed to use that card for anything. I happen to be a huge supporter of massive welfare reform. And these are maybe the sorts of things that need to be addressed. But we're not there yet. And, and you can't just do this to people. You can, Just Man. because you disagree. We got to change that. I, I didn't realize. <laughs> now, now you're very excited. Now you're yeah, very... Uh, this is... Oh, BS, man. What? You know what? I have purposely not said where this is because I can't tell. Oh, okay. There it is. Right at the top of the page. It's New Hampshire. It's the state of New Hampshire. Nice little, nice little state. You ever been? Yeah. Oh, you have? Yeah. It's, it's nice. How you know, is it? Very, it's about what you would expect. It's beautiful. But, you know, that's, yeah. that's basically it. Not very much to do. I only stayed there for one night. Went to a couple bars. But, yeah. Well, what do you do in where do you go? Um, well, where do you go in New You go to Concord? Well, what's what's in New Hampshire? Um, well, we were actually driving all the way around. It was me and my uncle, and uh, we oh, were. So you started in New York, so you were just going up and down the East Coast. Yeah, so we okay. just stopped at a lot of hotels. One of them was in New Hampshire. There was just like a rundown little bar across the street that we ended up going to uh, that night, and then ended up keep on going. So right. yeah, New Hampshire to me is the Wisconsin of the East Coast. Hmm. Maine is the Minnesota of the East Coast. They're just like, like there's not really a super major city there, you know. Mm. There's just, it's just a lot of trees, a lot of wildlife. I mean, I'm sure it's pretty. I'm, yeah. I'm sure New Hampshire is very pretty. I've just mm. never been there. It's one of those states that I. All right, on the probability of me going to New Hampshire because of its proximity to other places that I might go right. on the East Coast. Everything on the East Coast is close. Right. I, I couldn't so, believe how yeah. many places we were going to. So, uh, Hey, kids, leaving uh, Maine. Hey, kids, entering New Hampshire. Yeah. Hey, kids, leaving New Hampshire. Hey, kids, entering Connecticut. Yeah, I mean, it's like... Coming from Texas where you can spend days on the road and not get out. You can be in the same state. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. This state goes on forever. Yeah. Forever. You know, when I was a kid growing up, if you look at the state of Illinois, 
Okay, Illinois. Illinois is a, a a medium, upper medium sized state. You know, it's a, it's it's not uh, it's not crazy like when you went west and they just started just making giant squares. Just big blocks, yeah. <laughs> yeah big you know what? Blocks. F it. We'll just graph right. it out. <laughs> there's a, there's like a, the Illinois has got a weird you know character to its shape. It's kind of mm. kind of. I used to think as a kid, we used to go to uh, we used to go to St. Louis and we used to go to uh, the Southern Illinois University, which is down in Carbondale. Or do you say Carbondelay? Um, and I used to think, good Lord, what the hell is wrong with this state? The state is so long. When you start up at Chicago, in the very northeast section of the state of Illinois, and you get in a car and you get on either 55 or 57, and you just start heading down, down south. I mean, you are, you are in the car forever. Then I drove to Houston. <laughs> then I yeah. realized what a breeze Illinois is. Uh, Texas goes on and on and on, and not just in a north or south direction. Mm. East, well, west is worse than all of them. Yeah, from Dallas all the way west. I mean, my God, if you were in the East Coast, you could go through twelve to twenty states in the time that it takes you to go from Dallas to El Paso. Yeah. Oh, it's a it's a it's a brutal drive, and then any time that you are making like one of those drives, like uh, when I was with Danielle for a long time, we would go like basically from city to city, uh, whenever I would take like a break off or something, and we would spend like no joke six hours a trip going into different little parts of Texas, like it was nowhere outside of the state, but you uh, in one week we'd probably spend about thirty hours on the road, yeah, you know, just like there and back is a circle. And that's insane, all in one state. Texas should be like five states. Yeah. It should. It yeah. should. It should. If, if Texas was on the East Coast, it would be 15 states. Mm-hmm. It would be divvied up into. Eh. All right, so let's get into the douche tournament here. Who do you like? You got the, uh, you got the clerks uh, at the convenience store who made a big political stand in not allowing this guy to come in and buy his cigarettes, although he was legally allowed to do so with his welfare card. We've got the... Uh, 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 the people, the, the politicians in Miami who were all over the bath salts thing, enacting laws and forbidding people from selling bath salts, and, you know, making these special laws based on the zombie killer, only to find out yesterday that the zombie killer wasn't on bath salts at all. So it was all a big waste of time. Or you got the 17 year old girl in Australia who took a, a picture of her grandma's life savings, put it on Facebook, and then uh, got robbed seven hours later. Who's the douche of the day, Jimmy Ryan? Oh man, this one this one's tough. Um, the, I don't think it's tough. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm actually gonna okay. So with the bath salts thing, that's almost understood. I mean, like, I think that everyone kind of saw that somebody was gonna overreact with that one. I would imagine that if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen in Miami. Um, the person who was working the cash register, I, I kind of like that guy. <laughs> I know that he was basically enacting his own world. It's an old lady. It's but, an old okay. blue hair. Yeah, you know, so like, you know what? Fine, you at least got a conversation started, you know? So I have to go with the 17-year-old on Facebook posting her grandma's stuff. All right. All right. Very good. Uh, How about you? Yeah. <sighs> All right, let me run through these. Um I, I tend to agree with you with the convenience store clerk. I understand her outrage. I think it was inappropriately placed. I don't think it was her, poor, her her position to make that stand the way she did, but I understand it. And that's an incredibly complicated issue. Although there are probably people going, it's not complicated at all. Well, it is in the fact that it is actually a law. It is legal for him to do something that all of us obviously find offensive. Yeah, so but we it just is need to get legal. to that. So, yeah, so there, there are ways to fix that. And, and, again, as you pointed out, maybe this is an opportunity now for people to address this in the state of New Hampshire. Dear God, let's get to it. That people can buy lottery tickets and cigarettes and alcohol you know, and those, welfare. If you are somebody who smokes cigarettes um, and you're also broke, you've been through those days, especially when I was like a hardcore smoker, where I had to decide whether or not I was going to eat or get another pack of cigarettes. In many days, I got a pack of cigarettes. Okay, so, like... That's the kind of mentality wow. that these people are able to go out there and just be like, you know what? Screw it. I can get both. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, why not make them work for their cigarettes and their alcohol? That's the thing that usually, if you're really in one of those situations where you're down and out, you need to get back to work so you can get your cigarettes and alcohol. All right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I chew tobacco. Mm-hmm. And I, I have had to severely cut down on the amount of tobacco that I chew. 
For instance, I, I've cut down certain things. Like, uh, <laughs> this is kind of strange. I do not chew tobacco between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. Oh, yeah? Just little little rules that I put in my head just to kind of help me curb the amount that I'm doing and the amount that I'm spending on it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I no longer chew tobacco in my car. That used to be like, you know, people who smoke do that. They get in their yeah. car, they immediately light up a cigarette. Mm -hmm. It's habit. It's routine. It's yep. what they do. That was the hardest one to do. To just, in my car, no longer. Don't do it. Wow. It helps me cut down. Yeah. Because I don't want to, I don't wanna really want to have to choose between food and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, luckily, I don't smoke as much now, so I don't have to make that decision, but, yeah. All right, uh, so so we've got that one, so I understand that. I, actually, let's just cut to the chase here. I think that the 17-year-old girl was stupid. She's a stupid 17-year-old girl. My problem is with the politicians in Miami who once again went off half-cocked, trying to pander to the people who were scared yet again. And, and what did the Miami uh, politicians do? They made sure that people who were afraid of zombies on bath salts weren't going to be able to get their hands on the bath salts anymore. And then it turns out that the bath salts weren't at all even part of the problem here. The dude wasn't even on bath salts. <laughs> Yet bath salts took all of the blame. 20 years from now, when people talk about the Miami cannibal, it will be the guy that was on bath salts. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I have a but conspiracy brewing now. The, the guy who basically created bath salts uh, basically talked to a few investors. He was like, hey, you guys in? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, we don't really think so. It really took off, and the investors were like, we got to screw this guy. Let's tell everybody that That's the zombie it. guy <laughs> yeah. was on bath salts. Okay. <laughs> I could see that happening. Yeah. Oh, hold on a second here. My, my, I just lost my computer. I just lost. Uh, I just lost everything that's... Hold on a second. All right, let's move into a little watch list. A couple of things that I could suggest for us to watch tonight, if you want. Uh, well, I, personally, I will be watching nothing but uh, uh, Fox News tonight. Because it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun to see these people so upset. Are you able to stream that? Fox, Fox News? News? Yeah. I don't think so. Can you? I don't know. I may have to go to a bar, I guess. I don't have cable. You don't have cable? No. Nah. Right, come on over to my place. Oh, that's an option. We'll, we'll make a night of it. We'll yeah. hang out. We'll pick up some beer, maybe get a pizza. Yeah. And we'll watch Fox News. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It'll be fun. I know. Uh, well, you know what? I have to go to Brad's show, um, Brad LaCour, but I may come out before. Where's Brad Where's Brad playing? He's going to be at uh, Deep Ellum, um, the Comedy House in uh, Deep Ellum. Oh, okay. So, yeah, he's been doing shows there every uh, Thursday. Brad LaCour. Brad mm -hmm. LaCour, one of the best young comics here in Dallas. Not even young anymore. Not even a new comic. I mean, he's yeah. just one of the established guys. Yeah, he's headlining this one. He's been headlining, I think, over a month. Is Paco so. on this bill? I don't think so. No. -uh. No, I love him. when they work together. I love seeing Paco. Yeah. That is such... I'm so... I love that kid so much. He's not even a kid now. He's a grown-ass man. Yeah. But I remember him when he was a kid, and I remember him being an 18-year-old kid, and I remember thinking... There's something special about this weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's something, there's something special. And and now, now he's he's such a brilliant writer. Oh, I he mean, is. I, I I cannot get through a day without you know Paco's Facebook updates. Mm. He's hysterical. Speaking uh, of uh, brilliant writers, mm -hmm. uh, overly attached girlfriend. Yes. She's gotten she's gotten too cool for me. Overly attached girlfriend wants nothing to do with the Jimmy Ryan anymore. I, th I think that she's gotten too cool for me, and uh, it happened ever since uh, she got posted to the Daniel Tosh blog. So, oh uh, yeah. Yeah, I think she may have uh, she may have found something that might be a bit of a, a better platform. <laughs> She's happening. Yeah. All right, tonight on Fox at uh, let's see what time is this going to be. This is going to be seven o'clock tonight on Fox. Is this seven o'clock? I'm sorry, I'm just a little confused here. Uh, the choice. You know what this show is? No. This is the show. <laughs> Uh, all right, here, I'll read it to you. Actress Carmen Electra, singer Sophie Monk, reality TV star Hope DeWarchick. Carmen that? Electra, where did she come from? Like, she is, I haven't heard of her in forever. Oh, yeah, but you've, you've heard of TV reality star Hope DeWarchick? Oh, no. <laughs> And beauty pageant contestant Rima Faka. Look for, wow. Carmen Electra, who you just said, where did she ever go? Is the A-lister on this panel? Yeah. This is it? Wow. All right, the choice. This is the show where they look, uh, where, where they, they've completely ripped off the one innovation that The Voice 
you know, the NBC show where they're in chairs mm. and they hear someone singing. And if they like what they hear, they hit their chair and they turn around and they see the person that they just agreed to back, which is really funny because someone who's really ugly and not marketable at all can have like a fantastic voice. And then suddenly CeeLo Green will be like, man, I love that voice. And he'll turn around and he'll be like, oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> I can't market you. Wow. I can't sell any albums with you. You're disgusting. So that's fun. That's And that's, let's not kid ourselves, that's the point of the chair turning around. Yeah. To see the look of disappointment on the face of the judges when the person who sings so beautifully is ugly. Well, the voice has been totally ripped off. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in mm -hmm. the commercials. There's a new show called The Choice. Oh. <laughs> not to be confused with The Voice. No, not at all. That just totally ripped off the spinning chair bit. I mean, NBC <laughs> it, it were the innovators who gave us the spinning chair bit. It was the only reason that I watched The Voice, because that was cool. The spinning chair was cool. Somebody at Fox went, wow, NBC's having a lot of, uh, a lot of success with that voice. I think it's the chair. Yeah, it is. It's the chair. What if we did a show where we had a chair? Let's get the chair. Let's steal the chair. What if we called it something so similar to The Voice that uh, people would just see the chair and then hear the name and maybe they'd be confused and they'd watch our show. I mean, that's really what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's Jimmy, it's the exact same chair. Wow. How do these people walk around in these television creative circles and hold their head up? You know, the, 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 the guy, the executive producer of the, the Choice, do you think he feels awkward when he runs into the executive producer of The Voice? Yeah. I mean, like, these guys used to have to at least rip off ideas from other countries and then import them and do it that way. Nope, not anymore. They just rip off whatever's hot. The exact <laughs> yeah. same thing. I mean, otherwise, can you explain why we've got 15 different shows centered around pawn shops? Oh, man. Pawn, shop, pawn shops and storage lockers. That's, that's pretty much all we got now in reality TV. Oh, yeah, that. And they also like to give hillbillies reality shows. If you're wondering why I don't pay for television. <laughs> yeah, now you're finding out. Well, but, you know, you want to come over to my joint and you yeah. want to watch a little uh, Fox News. So, yeah. oh, Fox News is going to be so much fun tonight. I know. All right, so The Choice, uh, that's that's on tonight. Uh, basically, the, the deal with The Choice is that uh, you know, the, the, a group of celebrities who are looking for love, Jimmy, because it's so hard for Carmen Electra to get laid. So hard. I often uh, don't sleep at night because I think that she may be going into a bar and just being passed over by every guy in it. Sophie Monk, the, the only, uh, I would say, legitimate star on this panel. I mean, mm. she's a legitimate artist, Sophie Monk. She probably has a really tough time meeting guys. Yeah. And so does beauty queen contestant Rima Faka. I love that it's a beauty pageant contestant. She's not even like a winner. It's not even, you know, it used to be where if you needed to fill something with a C-lister, you'd go out and get a former Miss America or Miss USA. Right. No, they don't even want that now. They just want like the third runner-up. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? Third runner-up in some pageant is now a celebrity by our standards? What is wrong with us? It's network TV. I mean, they got a budget. It's Fox. Yeah. It's Fox. All right, so the choice. That's, uh, that's on tonight. Other than that, you know, there's a rock center. Um, but um, uh, the new show that I thought maybe debuted last night didn't, and that is uh, Anger Management, the new okay. Charlie Sheen show. Let me see. I'll pull up the exact time on this. All right. Where is FX here on my list? Where is FX? Is that meant to be good? Is that uh, anything, like, reviewed Charlie yet? Charlie Sheen show? Yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't really I, care for Two and a Half Men, but... Two and a Half... Uh, you, let me, you know what? Let me tell you something about Two and a Half Men, mm -hmm. all right? Because I've reversed my position on Two and a Half Men. I saw the very first episode of Two and a Half Men, and I remember going on the air the next day and talking about how it was the most contrived piece of stupid sitcom crap and that I would never watch it again. But I have seen episodes of Two and a Half Men in syndication where I've laughed. Mm -hmm. The writing on that show is not altogether terrible. I mean, it's the same guy who created Big Bang Theory. It's the right. same writer. You know, I mean, so it's not like he's a complete moron on one show and then is an exceptional writer on the other. Big Bang Theory is an exceptionally well-written show as far mm. as dialogue and all of that. So, I mean, I, I'm going to give them credit on Two and a Half Men. I, it isn't an altogether terrible show. It's actually, I, I find myself laughing. Mm -hmm. No, there's definitely some times when it's funny. For me, the thing that aggravates me a little bit is it's punchline-y. 
You know, like sometimes like somebody will set up a joke and you'll be like, oh, I know which one. I know which one's coming here. And then yeah. they say the line. Yeah. You know? Like at least in Big Bang Theory, they, they have to think things out a little bit. Like, for instance, like one of my favorite things about Big Bang Theory, and this shows how much of a geek I am, is the math in the background. It's always proper. It's always real. Oh, Big Bang Theory? Yeah, it's always yeah. real. It's always talking about force or, like, gravity or... Well, you know what I like about Chuck Lorre? Um, if you have a DVR at the very end of his... Uh, every mm. episode of the show that he does, he yeah. writes a blog. He writes a full three, four, five hundred word blog mm -hmm. at the end of every episode. And the only way you can see it is if you pause it at the right time yeah because it's only on screen for half a second mm -hmm. and then it goes away you know at the end where they show like the different production companies that are involved right. well chuck Lorre's is always a blog and i used to really enjoy at the end of big bang theory pausing it and reading the blog because many times it's about the episode we just watched yeah I did some, that for a few of them anyway i didn't read all of them are they all pretty good they're all good they're yeah. all good i read every single one of them hmm. every single one of them and, well they're, they're not all well chuck Lorre's is a good writer yeah. You know, it'd be like reading Chuck Lorre's blog every week. Mm -hmm. That's all. So it's, yeah. it's not too much of a... All right, now let's get into the big thing. This is the whole reason why I wanted to do a watch list today. Not only is anger management back tonight at 9... I'm sorry, 8 o'clock, 8, 8.30, 9, 9... Wait, hold on, let me make sure I got the times here right, because my, my thing says all times are Eastern. No, okay, maybe not. All right, maybe this is right. 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. All right, tonight at 8 o'clock on FX, the new Charlie Sheen show, Anger Management, of course, from the movie, the Jack Nicholson, Adam Sandler movie, Adam Sandler. That's on at 8 o'clock. At 8.30, uh, Wilfred. You watch Wilfred? No, I never get into it. No? Mm -mm. It's okay. It's, yeah. it's, it's okay. Wilfred is okay. Mm -hmm. Nothing really terrible about that. It's about a guy. Uh, is it Tobey Maguire? Yeah. Is that who it is? I think so. Or Elijah Wood. I get those guys confused. Whoa, I just realized I do too. Yeah, I get those guys confused. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. Elijah Wood, I think. Same way I used to get, years ago, I used to get Dennis Quaid and Kurt Russell confused. Because they were like the same actor. Uh-huh. Wow, that's really weird. Yeah, I can't think of which one it is, though. All right, whatever. It's one of those guys. And uh, he's basically had some kind of break from reality. And uh, Wilfred is the dog who lives next door. The dog of uh, this hot chick that uh, Toby Maguire Elijah Wood is like hot for, and uh, Toby Maguire Elijah Wood has had some kind of break from reality, and the dog that lives next door appears to him as a fully grown Australian guy in a dog suit, mm. who just always gets him into all kinds of trouble and is just a incorrigible. He's just a bad dog. It's pretty funny. Yeah, I saw the first couple episodes. I just never really got hooked on it. Um, I mean, it's but, stupid. It's 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 um it's absurdist comedy, mm -hmm. but it's it's actually pretty funny. The guy who plays the dog, the guy who plays Wilfred, is funny. He makes yeah. me laugh. Yeah, uh, I, I guess he started doing the show in Australia and then moved it over here. Yeah, is that what happened? It was a big hit in Australia, and, and then they they moved it here and recast the the human roles. But yeah, he mm -hmm. was the original dog in the Australian series. Uh, all right, so that's at 8.30 tonight, or is that 9? I can't tell. My thing is all screwed up. Hold on. All right, at any rate, just go to just go to FX tonight. Here's the rundown you're going to get, okay? You're going to get anger management, then you're going to get Wilfred, and then tonight, let's say 8.30. Let's say 8.30 or 9.30. I don't know, you're going to have to check. The greatest television show currently in production on American TV returns, and that is, of course, Louie. Louis C.K.'s television show. If you have not seen Louis C.K.'s television show, I believe this is the start of the third season, you are missing out. You are missing out on one of the greatest examples of the way the situation comedy format should have evolved years ago, but is evolving into now. Louis C.K. is a brilliant, a brilliant and hysterically funny stand-up comedian. Yeah. Now, do you like Louis? Oh, I love Louis. Um, and you know, he's, he, the thing is, is that it he's definitely was, yeah, the way that he produces his shows is like very much the way that other countries do theirs, where it's very dry. Louis does it especially good, but like, uh, it is something that I've, I've kind of gra like gravitated towards with other countries because they don't have even like, uh, the big bang theory. I stopped watching it because it just got too, too formulaic. Yeah. Yeah. And like, there's none of that in some of these other shows where it seems like the bar is set a little higher. I mean, like here, you know, we'll actually accept a half-assed show. 
You know, I don't know why that is. We're supposed to be the ones that are the greatest right. at making them. Um, but, like, there, for some reason, like, it just doesn't make the mark if it's not dry, good comedy like that. So. L- Louis C.K. is um, probably... Uh, and this was this was a great episode from last season. Did you see the Dane Cook episode? Mm, yeah. Okay, so here's what you need to know. In the world of stand-up comedy, the current world of stand-up comedy in America, you would be hard-pressed to find a stand-up comedian who is more respected and more critically loved than Louis C.K. Louis C.K. is the guy that everyone looks to and says, that's the greatest stand-up comedian living today. Mm-hmm. That right there. That guy, what that guy is doing with the art form is taking it to completely new places. His style is not derivative of anybody. Louis C.K.'s style of stand-up comedy is completely original, which, which is really rare in stand-up comedy when every other guy is, you ever wonder why? You know, that's Jerry Seinfeld. That's somebody who is derivative of Jerry Seinfeld's observation and style of comedy. Louis C.K. is a storyteller. He is, a, he is an brutally honest and 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 hysterically self-loathing modern american divorced father of two little girls and he gets up on stage and he doesn't play it for last i always think when louis ck gets up there he's not necessarily interested in making people laugh on the outside as much as he wants people to be stunned by how entertaining what he's saying is Mm -hmm. does that make sense to you oh totally yeah because his jokes don't have punchlines. His jumps, his jokes are just, uh, they appear to be a long, drawn out stream of consciousness, uh, consciousness commentary on life today as Louis. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it seems different and it feels different and people who really aren't fine-tuned to comedy might go, like in other words, you might take a girl to a Louis C.K. show and she might be like, this is stupid. Mm-hmm. This is boring. Wait, how come there's no punch? You know, like that. No, 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 no. Again, Louis C.K., Probably the most critically applauded and respected stand-up comedians in the world. I can't remember a time when there was a stand-up comic who was so appreciated in his own time among other comics and critics the way Louis C.K. is. Yeah, because other comics almost like him more than the actual audience people. Every, you know, people that would go to his shows. Every comic on the planet is gay for Louis C.K. Yeah. They are. They, they are, are all gay for him. They all, the, some of the, be- I mean, I have interviewed over the years the best comics of this generation. The top of the line people and every single one of them when you ask who's the funniest comic out there, they all to a man say, have you ever seen Louis C.K.? <laughs> have I seen Louis C.K.? He used to be a regular on our show before he got too big. Mm-hmm. Louis used to come in. All- Louis is brilliant. He's a god of comedy. Now, last season, they did an episode with Louis C.K., who is that guy, a respected, loved, adored uh, uh, comedian's comedian, and Dane Cook, <laughs> who is the number one grossing comedian in the world, the most successful stand-up comedian working today is Dane Cook. Dane Cook, the movie star. Dane Cook, the frat boy humor. Dane Cook, the slapstick guy. He is, without a doubt, he's playing Madison Square Garden. And there for years, uh, this was the, the purpose of the episode last year of Louie. For years, at least the last couple, there has been this sort of division in stand-up comedy, the Louis C.K. people who appreciate the art form and his talent, and then there's been the Dane Cook people who appreciate the fact that he gets $20 million a movie. You know, there's that. The episode (laughs) last season was Louis C.K.'s daughter wanted a ticket to the Dane Cook show. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. And she said, Daddy, you know Dane Cook, right? Because in the show, Louis C.K. plays himself. He plays Louis C.K., famous stand-up comic and his daughter wanted tickets to dane cook but louis hates dane cook can't stand him doesn't respect what he does and says as much in the episode you know basically talks about the problem he has with dane cook you know the the difference between their comedy and to dane cook's credit who by the way i'd like to say i think dane cook is funny Mm -hmm. i think dane cook's stand-up comedy is funny i don't think he's the greatest of all time i think he's a funny comic and you know, he's, he's definitely a mass appeal comic. When he first started out, he was hilarious. I thought so. I yeah. thought the very first uh, Circle of Truth or something, his first stand-up comedy special on HBO, I thought was terrific. Mm-hmm. I really, I've seen stuff since, not quite as good, but whatever, neither here nor there. Dane Cook is not a terrible comedian, okay? He's successful. He may not be what Louis C.K. is to the art form, but Dane Cook is not a terrible comedian. I find him uh, perfectly fine. If he was playing at the improv, I'd love to go see him. 
uh, one of the things I thought was really kind of cool um, that I did hear about that was that uh, Louis C.K. sent over the script as to how this basically was going to play out. And Dane Cook wanted to add to it and basically kind of change it up a little bit. Uh, still trying to keep it funny, but it, I guess he just didn't care for like some of the angles in it. Well, Dane Cook was the punchline of a lot of jokes leading yeah. up to the meeting in the episode. Yeah, and but Louis C.K. basically said, no, that's the way I really want this thing to go. And he was like, all right, and, he signed and, up and, for and it. And to Dane Cook's credit, even though he was hacked to pieces by all the other comics in mm. the show, in the episode, going, Louis, you can't ask Dane Cook for a ticket for your daughter to see his show. Mm. That guy's a complete tool. What are you doing? That guy stands for everything that we find reprehensible about commercialized stand-up com It was all of that. And Dane Cook, to his credit, said, yeah, I'll do the show. And he had to go backstage. The scene was Louis had to go backstage and meet with Dane Cook and basically talk to him about the ticket for his daughter. That bodyguard situation. Yeah, and, yeah. and Dane Cook played it up for laughs. You know, it was like in Apocalypse Now, you mm -hmm. know, when they finally find Colonel Kurtz in the cave. <laughs> That's how Dane Cook's dressing room was. And Louis C.K. has to walk in, and, you know, Dane, the emperor, is like in his room. And, and they had about a 15-minute conversation Two people, revealed to me to be two smart people. I mm -hmm. didn't think that Dane Cook was all, all that bright. I mean, I didn't think he was a moron because he's, you know, he's obviously a working comic and that takes some sensibility. But Dane Cook really impressed me. And they basically sat down, Louis C.K., again, the world's most critically appreciated comic, and Dane Cook, the world's most commercially successful comic, they sat down on an episode of Louis and they had to have a conversation about what they don't like about one another's comedy. It was awesome. It was. It was a mind-blowingly great episode. There's another great episode of Louie where he's sitting there with, uh, I want to say Robert Kelly, the comedian, and they're talking, oh, no, it was Nick DiPaolo. Okay. And they were talking about race relations in America. Mm -hmm. It was the most honest discussion of the way people feel about different races I've ever heard on television, and I was blown away that they did it. That's that's what you get with FX, though. Yeah, uh, this is an ABC. That something like that could never air. A show like Louis could never air on anything but an HBO, a Showtime, or an FX. Louis is back tonight. Do yourself a favor if you don't watch Louis, check it out. And then finally tonight, debuting at uh, nine o'clock or ten o'clock, I guess ten o'clock Central Time. I'm very excited about this show, Brand X debuts on FX tonight. Do you know what Brand X is? No, I haven't heard about this. Brand X is Russell Brand's new television show. Oh, I did. Yes, I'm really excited about this. Where from, yeah. from everything that I've heard about Russell Brand's new television show, it is going to be him for a half hour ranting. Oh, that's exactly what I want. About it. Not a sitcom. <laughs> yes. It's not an interview show. Now, now, I don't know this for sure. I just know from what I've seen in the little bit that I've read about it. Uh, how, do you how do you feel about Russell Brand? Oh, I love Russell Brand. I love him. He's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Want to not like him. I really wanted to not like him in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because like, oh, who is this screaming English junkie? Yeah. You know, that's basically what I said. Yeah. Everything that I've come to learn about Russell Brand since that moment makes me love him. Yeah. Makes me think, God, this is a good dude. Did you see him uh, talk to Parliament I sure about did. drugs? Yeah. That was unbelievable. Testified in front of English Parliament about uh, the problems with addiction and all that because he's a recovered heroin addict. He, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he really got his life together, and, yeah. and his career took off as soon as he got clean. But you know what I like most about Russell Brand? What's that? This is the coolest thing that I've ever seen with a celebrity breakup. When he and Katy Perry broke up, mm -hmm. they were married. Katy Perry, I kissed the girl, and you know all right. that stuff. Uh -huh. um, when he and Carrie, Katy Perry broke up, Katy Perry is worth about 10,000 times what Russell Brand is worth. Mm -hmm. Russell Brand had the right, because they were married in the state of California, to take 50% of everything, of all the marital assets, yeah. which he only probably contributed about 5% to. The other 95 was all from Katy Perry touring and selling records and all of that stuff. And you know what Russell Brand said? Hmm. No, 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 baby. Look, I, I loved you once. I don't want to do that. I'm fine. My career is fine. I don't want to dime. Took nothing. Actually gave her the house. Nice. The house that is supposedly the house that he bought and that he built. He actually gave that to her. Because he didn't want, he didn't feel that he needed anything. He wasn't like, uh, his, his standard of living wasn't going to drop dramatically. He's a wealthy television and movie star in his own right. But according to the law, 
He had the right to really rob Katy Perry, and he didn't. And yeah. I wonder, has there ever been the reverse? Has there ever been a situation where a woman, like let's say someone of Carmen Electra's level, marries someone of uh, Steve Jobs' level, Right. okay? Would they get a divorce and would, would Carmen Electra ever say, would a woman ever say, no, you know what, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I can go back to my condo and I've got a nice car and I, I work. I make, you know, I make about a million dollars a year. I'll be fine. I don't need your two and a half billion dollars. That would never happen. I don't yeah. think women are wired that way. I just don't think that it's, I think that it's more socially accepted for them to just assume that they that do it's have their it. right yeah. it's their right whereas a guy i mean like if uh, i know that my two breakups i just said here take it all i'll yeah. just start over right. so I, mean, like, I gave them the apartment all the furniture in there and then i just started over yeah which is why i haven't done that again but i mean like uh you know when that comes to that point like as a guy i just didn't feel like i could just start taking everything out and starting to you know i'm gonna yeah. go ahead and worry about myself but that's one of the reasons that i like russell brand that yeah. that and the character that he's done in two movies now of Aldous Snow, who I think is... Uh, Aldous Snow is the rock star character from Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then he reprised the role of Aldous Snow in Get Him to the Greek with yes. Jonah Hill. Yeah. That's a funny character. Yeah. I, I would actually keep on watching that character do movies. Yes. Yeah. I want to hear more music. I want to uh, hear more African Child. Inside <laughs> of you. <laughs> inside of you. He, play, he, plays a, he plays a very stereotypical British rock star named Hel- Aldous Snow, mm. who is completely irresponsible, self-centered, <laughs> just an awful person. All right, so there you go. There's a lot of good stuff on television to watch tonight. I know that I've been sort of laying low in the weeds here on the television watch list stuff, but there really hasn't been much. But FX tonight, they uh, debut their new summer lineup. Anger Management, the new Charlie Sheen series, followed by Wilfred, followed by the greatest show in the history of television, Louie, and uh, a very interesting new show from Russell Brand. Brand X with Russell Brand. All right, there you go. That's everything from today. Jimmy, anything? Do we leave anything on the table? No, that's a hell of a lineup. Um, but um, uh, if you aren't going to be watching TV, uh, definitely come out and see Brad uh, at the Comedy House in Deep Ellum. Yes, Brad LaCour will be performing at yeah. the Comedy House in Deep Ellum. All right, Jimmy Ryan, that's going to do it for us today. Sorry, we went a little bit late. I know, I'm sorry. It's all good. I'm sorry. Well, we had healthcare stuff. Yeah. We went one segment too long. You eliminate that extra segment of healthcare talk, and we're out of here on time. I know. We are. All right, we'll be back tomorrow. Jimmy Ryan and myself, Pugs Moran, PMS on thebarlive.com.